Okay, good afternoon and welcome to today's oversight hearing on the Parking Violations Bureau. My name is Daniel Drum and I'm chair of the Finance Committee. Today's hearing is being jointly held with the Committee on Transportation, chaired by Councilmember Idanis Rodriguez, and the Committee on Governmental Operations, chaired by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. Uh, we've been joined today by Minority Leader Steve Matteo, uh, Councilmember Peter Ku, Councilmember Costa Constantinides, Councilmember Alan Maisel, Councilmember Barry Gudenchik, Councilmember um, Mark Jonai, Councilmember Reverend Ruben Diaz Sr., Councilmember um, uh, Councilmember Yeager, I think I got everybody so far. Okay, good. Uh, in addition to conducting oversight of the Parking Violations Bureau, we will be hearing 11 bills which propose to adjust its adjudication and collection f uh, function or to otherwise adjust the city's parking rules or enforcement regime. As a result, we're going to keep our opening remarks brief before diving into the Department of Finance testimony, question from the members and the bills themselves. Last year, more than 10 million parking tickets alleging violations of DOT parking rules or state and local law were written, primarily by NYPD traffic enforcement agents, but also by NYPD officers and by representatives from several dozen other municipal agencies and entities. About 10% of violations are contested and adjudicated by an administrative law judge at the Parking Violations Bureau, either at an in-person hearing or remotely upon submission supporting evidence by mail, online, or by DOF smartphone app. Unpaid parking violations accrue late fees and ultimately become judgment debt, uh, which, is, which once it exceeds $350, permits the Department of Finance Sheriff and City Marshals to pursue that debt by booting and towing. In 2004, the Department of Finance had a voluntary enrollment program for businesses, the Stipulated Fine and Commercial Abatement Program, which provide them discounts on certain parking violation fines in exchange for waiving their appeal rights. Such programs represent about 10% of total ticket volume. Finally, last December, the Department of Finance created the Office of Parking Summons Advocate to help the public understand their hearing rights and also to help identify systemic issues. We look forward to learning more about the office and its efforts. Let me briefly mention the four bills that are in the Committee on Finance that are being heard today. Intro 661, sponsored by Councilmember Rodriguez, would require DOF to report on cars towed because of outstanding parking tickets. Intro 1066, sponsored by Councilmember Lanceman, would permit an ALJ in the Parking Violations Bureau to reduce or waive late penalties in the interest of justice. Unpaid parking violations accrue late fees and ultimately become judgment debt, which once it exceeds $350, permits the Department of Finance, Sheriff, and City Marshals to pursue that debt by booting and towing. Since 2004, the Department of Finance has had a voluntary enrollment Pro, has had voluntary enrollment programs for businesses. Okay, intro 441, introduce, uh, sponsored by Councilmember Constantinides, will prohibit uh, reducing parking violation fines absent a hearing and a written determination. Intro 1520, which I have sponsored, would require DOF to report on the operations of the Parking Violations Bureau. I'll now turn the mic over to Councilmember Rodriguez for his remarks, and then we'll hear from Councilmember Cabrera. Thank you, Chair. First of all, one thing that I, that I would like to be clear is that this package of bill by no means that we are compromising enforcement. We want to be sure that drivers are accountable. We are to be sure that whoever break the law should pay for the consequences. So by no means, uh, as we hold in this hearing, we're sending the message to our city that uh, we want uh, to reduce any level of enforcement. This is about bringing clarity and fairness in this process when it comes to the parking status in our city. Thank you, Chair Drum and Chair Cabrera. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing. I'm Council Member Danis Rodriguez, Chairman of the Committee of Transportation. As you heard, as you heard, 
heard today the committees on finance, transportation, and governmental operation are conducting a joint oversight hearing on the Parking Violations Bureau that also includes several bills related to parking violations, fines, towing, abandoned vehicles, and construction parking permits. Of the legislation that we are hearing today, I will quickly summarize those bills that are in the Transportation Committee. Intro 122 by Council Member Lander will increase the monetary thirst hold for the removal of motor vehicles for the purpose of satisfying parking violation judgments from $350 to $500. It will also allow motor vehicles to be removed for the purpose of satisfying parking violation judgments where there are more than five parking violations. Intro 176 by Council Member myself will create an interagency task force to study the city's existing system or removing from public street vehicles that have been abandoned or parked without license plate or proper registration. The task force would collect information about the effectiveness of current practices and evaluate potential solutions to this problem in a final report. Council member Coloswitz, would, who has two bills to date, the first is intro 504 that would make DOT temporary parking restriction permits at construction sites 7 a.m. from 6, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. by default instead of 24 hours with a variance for 24 hours permit obtainable through the departments of buildings. The second intro file six will make it a violation to park a mobile home on a residential street in excess of, the, of three hours or overnight and would make mobile homes park in violation subject to impoundment. Council Member Jonah also have two bills on today's agenda. Intro 1187 would place a strict timelines on the Department of Transport or Sanitation and private towers to remove vehicles left on the street without license plate or registration as, as stickers. Intro 1188 will make removing license plate or registration stickers unlawful and will raise the penalty for abandoning cars or other large property or removing components of motor vehicles to $500. Before turning back to back over to Chair, Chair Drummond Cabrera, I want to touch upon two of the other bills. First, I'm looking forward to hearing testimony from the administration and advocates on the stipulated fines program and intro 1141. I am co-sponsor of this bill as are many of my colleagues, and I believe we need learn to learn more about the pros and cons of this program and how it influences the behavior of commercial drivers on our streets. With the rise of Amazon and e-commerce, delivery trucks are crowding our streets and often have nowhere to go because curb space is taken up by the private vehicles. This problem is not going away, and we need to think about all aspects of the commercial deliveries, including the stipulated fines program, allocating curb space in ways that are most beneficial to the city as a whole, increasing loading zones and expanding DOTs of hours deliveries program. Intro number six is one, a bill that I have a sponsor, this piece of bill legislation will require the Department of Finance to issue a biannual report on the number of motor vehicles that were towed because of the owners owe more than $300, $350 in our standing parking tickets. Having this information will help us to evaluate whether the city's practice of towing these vehicles is effective or equitable. I look forward to hearing the testimony from the administration and all the other stakeholders, and I hope that we can come up with some sensible recommendation on how to move forward these bills. And before uh, turning to Council, uh, 
Thank you, uh, Chair. I'm sorry. Thank you again, Chair Drum. And before turning to Councilman Cabrera, I would like to also apologize because I will be leaving this hearing before then. Thank you. Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I am the chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. I want to thank my fellow chairman, Councilmember Danis Rodriguez and Daniel Trump for organizing this oversight hearing. Today, the Governmental Operations Committee will be conducting a first hearing on, on Introduction 168, sponsored by Councilmember Alan Marcel, which will transfer the Parking Violations Bureau from the Department of Finance to the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings. Oath was originally established in 1979 for the limited purpose of conducting administrative trials and hearings at the direction of the mayor or for civil service related hearings. In subsequent years, the number of variety of cases referred to Oath grew significantly. In 2008, it took on summonses issued by the Department of Sanitation buildings, environmental protection, fire, and environmental, and environmental protection. In 2011 and 2016, it took on tribunals that were run by the, by the Health Department, the Taxi and Limousine Commission, and the Department of Consumer Affairs. And in 2017, it began hearing on low-level summonses from NYPD that used to be file in criminal court. Today, with the exception of the Parking Violations Bureau, all significant agency tribunals are now adjudicated by oath. Introduction 168 will transfer the Parking Violations Bureau to oath. All employees, businesses, uh, rules, regulations, records, property, and equipment will be transferred to oath. No pending proceedings are to be affected by the transfer. I would like to thank my committee staff, Daniel Collins, Elizabeth Cronk, Emily Forjohn, as well as my own legislative director, Claire McLevain. Now I'd like to turn it back uh, to my esteemed uh, uh, co-chair, Daniel Drum. Thank you very much, Chair Cabrera. And before I turn it over to the sponsors of the legislation, I'd like to say that we've been joined by Council Members Moyer, Council Member Kalos, and Council Member Cornegie. And uh, Council Member Constantinidis, I know you wanted to make a statement as well. Thank you, Chair Drum, Chair Rodriguez, Chair Cabrera. Uh, in, I just want to quickly address uh, our, my legislation, Intro 1141. Uh, created in 2005, the stipulated fan, fines program was intended to be a way for the city to guarantee a stream of revenue from delivery trucks that double parked, blocked traffic lanes or crosswalks or commit other traffic infractions without having to expand the city's uh, adjudicatory system. Uh, it should be apparent you know, right now that our city is facing different challenges in a different time. Over the past few years, this council has worked with the administration to combat the serious issues of traffic safety and congestion, and we've made lots of great progress. Uh, a program where trucks have no incentive to find even something resembling a legal parking space impedes our progress on all of our, these objectives. When a truck blocks a lane of traffic on a two-way street, for instance, it blocks a critical line of sight down a street needed to walk, bike, or drive safely. Cars having to enter the opposite lane to pass the truck after waiting to find a safe chance to pass only slows down traffic in both directions. In fact, uh, DOF Commissioner Jacques Gina own admission, the program needs to be reformed in part to ease congestion. Uh, all this comes to cost as 43% of the 2.6 million, 2 million parking violations issued in FY17 fell within the stipulated fines and commercial abatement programs. And while DOF is now acting to roll in the worst excesses of the programming, they are still offering discounts on a number of fines. Incredibly, they're actually lowering the fines for blocking bike lanes, crosswalks and sidewalks, and intersections. Consequently, the city will be foregoing tens of millions of dollars in potential fees when the cost of adjudicating each parking ticket decreases as more and more ticket disputes are heard online, not by a judge. Uh, that's why intro 1141 is so important. It would simply require DOF and the Parking Violations Bureau to treat each violation as an individual infraction, rather than allowing them to be collectively disposed of. You can't put a price on safety, but that's what this program has done for too long. I want to thank Chair Drum, Rodriguez, and Cabrera, and all the staff that helped put this 
to hearing together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I believe that uh, Councilman Maisel has a statement also. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, just speak very, very briefly about uh, 168 and uh, 176. One of the most consistent complaints that I get in my office uh, is the unfairness that people feel when they go before the Parking Violations Bureau. Uh, the Parking Violations Bureau basically is the, the judge, the juror, and the beneficiary of the fines that they impose. Uh, that can't be fair. If you go before a uh, hearing officer, that hearing officer is under a certain amount of uh, pressure to make sure that too many people with uh, innocent pleas who are actually right um, get a fair uh, shake. Because if they don't do what um, they're expected, they don't get uh, reassigned or reappointed. So um, as Mayor de Blasio said, he wants to make New York the fairest big city in the, in the country, certainly. Um, by moving PVB to Oath, uh, people will get the understanding that Oath is impartial. They don't work for anybody. Uh, they are not the beneficiaries of the fines that are imposed, and I trust Oath to do the right thing. So I really would like to see this bill passed, and I appreciate the opportunity to have it heard. And the second uh, bill, which is uh, 176, uh, in certain communities in the city, uh, there is a huge increase in the number of parked vehicles that are parked illegally. And uh, in my district in particular, because it's a uh, one or two family home area, uh, we don't have too many commercial streets, we are inundated with cars that are being trucked in, literally trucked in and, and dumped on the streets. And um, not enough is being done to resolve this problem. And I speak to colleagues uh, in similar situations, uh, the local police departments do not have the ability to deal with this issue the way it should be dealt with. And that's why I think we need to have uh, put a lot of heads together and talk about uh, this problem, and that's why an interagency task force is, is necessary. So thank you, Mr. T Chairman, and Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, be heard. Thank you very much. Uh, we've also been joined by Councilmember Mark Levine. Uh, we'll now hear from several representatives of the Department of Finance, good, good starting, <laughs> starting with uh, Jeffrey Shear, Deputy Commissioner of Treasury, Payments and Operations, Sheila Feinberg, Director of Government Affairs, and the Sheriff, Joe Fusito, as well as a representative from the Department of Transportation, Josh Benson, after they are sworn in by Council. Good afternoon. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Drum, Rodriguez, Cabrera, and members of the Committees on Finance, Transportation, and Government Operations. I am Jeffrey Shear, Deputy Commissioner for Treasury and Payment Services at the New York City Department of Finance. With me today is New York City Sheriff Joseph Fusito, Sheila Feinberg, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs at the Department of Finance, and Joshua Benson, Deputy Commissioner for Traffic Operations at the Department of Transportation. The first of the bills that DOF would like to address is intro 1141, which relates to our stipulated fine and commercial abatement programs. Before addressing the specifics of the bill, we would like to provide some context as to why these two programs exist. All motorists receiving parking summonses have a constitutional due process right to contest the summonses if they choose. This right applies to both individuals and commercial entities. There is no way to compel motorists to pay for parking summonses without first offering the chance to contest them. Further, Motorists may offer a variety of defenses in contesting a parking ticket, including that their vehicle was not properly identified, that the ticket agent did not properly indicate the parking infraction, that proper notice was not given regarding the prohibited action, or that their vehicle did not commit the specified infraction. One defense for commercial vehicles is provided by the city's parking rules. 
The rules recognize the lack of available parking spaces and the need for commercial vehicles to make deliveries to city businesses and individuals by providing an expeditious delivery defense for some parking infractions. The expeditious delivery defense is often asserted by companies and their parking ticket brokers, and many tickets are dismissed in this manner. For example, in fiscal year 18, 67% of tickets for double parking outside of Midtown Manhattan were dismissed as part of our fleet program, in which companies, regularly, companies receive regular reports of their parking tickets and retain the right to contest them. In addition, it is generally more difficult for traffic agents and police officers to identify commercial vehicles than passenger vehicles. 98% of tickets issued to individuals are incurred by vehicles with a passenger registration type. But tickets issued to business vehicles are more evenly divided between vehicles with registration types such as commercial, medallion, livery, rental, light trailer, regular trailer, and semi-trailer. The misidentification of vehicle registration type may result in the dismissal of a parking ticket. Traffic agents and police officers must also make fine distinctions between commercial vehicle body types. Recent court decisions resulted in the dismissal of tickets did, that did not correctly distinguish between tractor trailers and other truck body types and between international registration plate and a portion truck um, body registration types, even for vehicles registered outside of New York in a state that does not make such distinctions. DOF is drafting state legislation that would prevent tickets from being dismissed for such technical reasons. Lastly, companies are more likely to hire parking ticket brokers who are experts in finding deficiencies in parking tickets and are therefore also more likely to contest parking tickets. With this in mind, DOF created the Stipulated Fine and Commercial Abatement Programs. The purpose of the programs was not to discount tickets, but rather to look at the dismissal rate of parking tickets by companies enrolled in our fleet program and charge the same expected value or outcome for contested tickets without the need for formal hearings. Companies participating in the program waive their right to a hearing and agree to pay roughly the same rate as companies that actively contest their tickets. As a result, program participants do not need to hire a parking ticket broker to review outstanding tickets, establish a defense, or attend a hearing. The Department of Finance, for its part, does not need to hire judges to adjudicate these hearings. In fiscal year 19, DOF did make an important adjustment to the programs. We determined that as an inducement to get large companies to join the program, shortly after it was piloted in 2003 and went widespread in 2005, we did charge rates that were significantly less than those warranted by the dismissal rates in the fleet program. We therefore conducted a review in 2018 that included outreach to DOT, the NYPD, and to many of the companies enrolled in the programs. As a result, DOF made major changes to the payment schedule for the programs as of December 3, 2018. For the stipulated fine program, rates were increased for 38 violations including 11 violations for which we decided that the seriousness of the offense would not cause us to charge less than the base fine. We also aligned the smaller commercial abatement program payment rates with those of the stipulated fine program. These changes will increase payments from program participants by $7.2 million in fiscal year 19 and $12.3 million in each fiscal year thereafter. With this context in mind, DOF opposes Intro 1141. 
Intro 1141 would prohibit the stipulated fine and commercial abatement programs. Current participants would simply hire parking ticket brokers rather than pay the full base fine amounts. With no change to the payments made for illegal parking, there would be no impact on congestion in the city. The impact of the law would be to drive up the business of the parking ticket brokers, but leave parking ticket revenue unchanged while significantly increasing the city's cost. First, the city would have to hire more judges for additional park it, parking ticket hearings. Second, the bill requires that our judges write formal decisions for all parking tickets contested in our commercial adjudications unit, as opposed to the current practice in which judges enter the results of each contested ticket without having to write a formal decision. This includes parking tickets that are currently adjudicated in CAU for companies that can test tickets outside the stipulated fine and commercial abatement programs. The combined cost increase would be over $9 million annually. Furthermore, we would expect a cash flow intro issue in fiscal year 20 as our ability to hire and train more judges would lag behind the demand for more hearings and hearing decisions, creating a backlog of tickets awaiting a hearing. <laughs> Intro 1066. The Department of Finance is committed to transparency and fairness, and our current adjudication process allows for every New Yorker to contest their parking tickets and be heard by an administrative law judge. While DOF understands the council's interest in allowing judges to obey the penalty without dismissing an entire violation, the bill in its current form does not provide a methodology or rubric that would give guidance to our judges as to when to obey the penalty without dismissing the entire ticket. The, the dismissals would likely be subjective, which would be unfair to the public and to the judges who are trying to fairly and consistently apply the law. The likely result would be complaints from motorists who did not receive penalty abatements and could not receive a satisfactory explanation as to why. Furthermore, without a methodology, DOF has no way to estimate the impact the bill would have on parking ticket revenue. DOF, therefore, must oppose the bill. However, DOF would like to have time to further explore the possibility of giving judges the ability to dismiss penalties under limited, well-defined circumstances and to begin a conversation with the council on this matter. We envision taking into account, for example, the length of time that has elapsed before a member of the public has received a parking ticket to encourage good behavior and to tailor penalty abatements to individual motorists who now can be assisted by DOF's parking summons advocate but do not have access to the wide variety of programs that are offered to commercial motorists. We look forward to having this conversation. Intro 122. The Department of Finance understands that this bill would increase the monetary threshold for the removal of motor vehicles for the purpose of satisfying parking, viola uh, parking violation judgments from $350 to $500. While it may have been unintended, this bill rewards people who hold off on resolving their parking tickets by making payments or contesting the tickets. It also runs counter to some of the city's Vision Zero goals because it applies to all parking violations, including red light camera violations, for example. The Department of Finance's Scofflaw Enforcement Program sees 118,000 vehicles in calendar year 18. Vehicles are initially booted and are then towed if payment is not made within 48 hours. This represents the enforcement of 551,000 outstanding parking, speed, camera, and red light camera violations. This legislation, if enacted, would result in a 65% reduction in scofflaw seizures annually. 
a 65% reduction in scofflaw seizures would exempt approximately 240,000 parking, speed, and red light camera violations from being enforced. It would trigger a 46% reduction in deterrence enforcement for speed, camera, red light camera, and other public safety violations. The 46% reduction would amount to approximately $24 million in lost revenue annually. In addition to creating a culture of compliance for parking and camera violations, the booting program provides DOF with an opportunity to check that seized vehicles have proper registration and insurance. Of the 118,000 vehicles seized in calendar year 18, 13,000 were retained in sheriff's custody for being unregistered and uninsured, making New York City's streets safer. If the boot threshold were raised to $500, approximately 6,000 fewer unregistered and uninsured vehicles would be kept off the streets. Intro 661. This bill requires the Department of Finance to report on the motor vehicles which were removed to satisfy outstanding judgments for parking violations totaling more than $350. DOF is committed to transparency and broadly supports this bill. We already provide some of this data on the open data portal, including the date of removal, the amount of outstanding judgments for parking violations, whether the motor vehicle had been booted prior to being removed, and whether the motor vehicle was redeemed or sold at auction. DOF can provide a report to the council on these data points, but we wanted to make sure that the council is aware that this information is already available on open data. There are two additional data sets that the council is requesting, the location and council district from which the motor vehicle was removed. DOF has strong concerns about the former as releasing the specific location information on open data or in a report could be a violation of the privacy of the owners of the booted vehicles. In addition, releasing this data could serve as a roadmap for predatory businesses and individuals to approach the vehicle owners. As for the council district level information, that data is not yet available but DOF will have a new vendor and it will be possible to provide this information on open data later this year. Intro 1520. This local law would require the Department of Finance to report on the operations of the Parking Violations Bureau, including specific information about the number and types of parking violations issued by the Bureau, the efficiency of its parking violation penalty collection, and the adjudication processes efficiency and outcomes. DOF is supportive of this bill as it aligns with our transparency goals. We do want to note, however, that staff working on parking summons related matters and functions are located in various divisions throughout the agency and not together in a central unit. Bills added last week. As for the six bills that were added last week, DOF, other impacted agencies, and the administration are still reviewing. But we do have some preliminary thoughts on intro 168. Let me begin by sharing some of the efforts DOF has undertaken to improve the customer's experience with regard to appealing parking tickets and navigating the adjudication process. In April 2017, DOF introduced its Payer Dispute mobile app, which allows motorists to use their cell phones to pay or request a hearing for a parking ticket. The app also allows users to upload photographs as evidence for contested tickets. Since its introduction, the Payer Dispute app has been downloaded over 862,000 times. Over 1.4 million tickets have been paid using the app, and over 489,000 hearings have been requested. For the 23-month period before and after the launch of the mobile app, the increase in hearings adjudicated 
was approximately 230,000. In April 2018, the Department of Finance launched a new office, the Office of the Parking Summons Advocate, which is headed by Jean Wesch. The purpose of this office is to help New Yorkers with parking and camera violation issues and complaints that cannot be resolved through normal Department of Finance channels. Mr. Wesch and his team provide services to motorists in person and our five borough business centers on a rotating basis. In addition to receiving referrals via mail and email, the office gives customers tips on how to effectively present their evidence in contesting summonses, assist them in filing appeals, and bring systemic issues to the attention of DOF and DOT staff. It is important to note that the Office of the Parking Summons Advocate supports individuals directly, not individuals and companies that can afford to hire parking ticket brokers to advocate on their behalf. Also, many people are not aware that the dismissal rate for individuals who contest summonses before an administrative law judge is 45%. Furthermore, DOF has taken steps to ensure that its different divisions performing parking summons functions operate independently of one another. In particular, the adjudications division is separate from the legal affairs division, which handles enforcement matters. Please note that the adjudications division and its administrative law judges do not have revenue goals. The judges are trained to fairly apply the law and issue impartial decisions on the cases before them. Their primary performance measure is how quickly the public is served. Wait time for the public to see a judge for a parking summons is typically under two minutes, and the entire hearing process for individual respondents takes 10 to 15 minutes. Hearings run by the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings are typically longer and more detailed. For these reasons, and because the city's law department is still reviewing the bill, DOF and OATH impose intro 168 as the current system works for all New Yorkers. As mentioned earlier, DOF, other impacted city agencies, and the administration are still reviewing the other bills that were added to this hearing. However, our not testifying or commenting on these bills should not be interpreted as support or even neutrality. We look forward to continuing the conversation with the council before the bills are considered for passage. In closing, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, before we go to questions, let me say we've been joined by council members Cohen, Rosenthal, Powers, Van Bremer, Kumbo, uh, Kumbo, and Rose. And um, let me start off by asking some questions about the stipulated fine program. In December, a new fine schedule went into effect um, for the stipulated fine program and for the commercial abatement program. What were your objectives in generating the new fine schedule? So our objectives was to more closely align the payment schedule used for those programs with the outcomes of hearings for commercial vehicles in our uh, fleet program. Did you consult with others before implementing the new program? We did. We Who? consulted with the Department of Transportation, the um, New York Police Department, and we also held meetings with um, many of the companies participating in the um, stipulated fine and commercial abatement programs. So does the new fine program um, uh, reflect substantive uh, policy decisions, the things that the city cares more about, like um, blocked bus lanes or bike lanes, or does it merely reflect um, the, uh, dis the dismissal rates? So it, it reflects both. So there are 11 violations for which we are now charging the full base rate um, due to the seriousness of the violations. And I have a list here. So they include um, camera-related violations. Um, so that's actually two types, um, the speed camera violations and the red light 
camera violations. Oh, and the third, the bus lane violations. Um, handicap permits um, are charged the full base fine. Pedestrian ramp blockage, fire hydrant, um, as indicated before, bus lane violations, bus parking in lower Manhattan, obstructing traffic, blocking the intersection, idling, overnight trailer parking, and standing in taxi for higher vehicle relief zones. So those are all charged the full pace fine under the new schedule. Has there been any substantial change in the number of people uh, or companies that have um, been registered for the stipulated fine program since the new fines went into effect? There was a small number of companies that withdrew from the program. A small number that what? A small number of companies that withdrew from the program. So it went down a little? It went down, um, yes. I think about a, a dozen, 20? Uh, 20 altogether. Okay, so sometimes uh, the stipulated fine program is uh, criticized um, for, for providing a, discount, a discount to larger companies who get a lot of parking tickets. How do you respond to that? Right, so we would say first, it's not a discount. We, by aligning the programs, we're making sure that what the companies pay in the stipulated fine program is roughly correlated to what companies who are contesting the tickets pay. If the program was to be shut down, companies would then be hiring parking ticket brokers, contesting the tickets, and paying the same amount. We also want to point out that the stipulated fine program is available for large and small companies. You need as few as one vehicle and be involved in um, commercial um, services in order to be enrolled in the stipulated fine program. It is not limited to large companies. In your testimony, you mentioned um, that uh, you were opposed to 1141, I believe, and you mentioned that it would cost about $9 million to the city. Can you give us a breakdown of um, how you got that estimate? So what we did was we looked at two things. One was what would the cost be to hold all those additional hearings? So that means hiring more administrative law judges um, or having them work longer hours. So that cost was a little under a million dollars to hold the hearings. The bill also requires that for every single parking ticket heard that a formal decision be issued. These decisions are usually two, three, four pages and having to do that not only for um, companies that were moving from the stipulated fine program but also for companies that are already enrolled in the fleet program and already contest tickets via our commercial adjudications unit all of those tickets would have to be written up um, after each hearing. So the cost of that is actually far la larger. That's a little over $8 million a year to, to write up all of those adjudications. So it's my understanding that you originally implemented this program through rules changes within DOF. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, and. Is it true that in a city like Washington, D.C., that had a similar program, that they just uh, ended their program? Are you aware of that? I'm not familiar with um, the example of Washington, D.C. Because that's what I've heard, then, that they recently um, gave up their program. Uh, I was just wondering if you had heard of that or um, knew of any of the results. Uh, we, we are not familiar with that. Uh, again, we feel that the reform that we've made of the program um, makes that unnecessary. We, we think that where the program stands now serves New Yorkers. Is it true that uh, in order to maintain the stipulated fine program membership, the company must be clean of scoff law judgments? Um, so if there is a company that does have scoff law um, violations against it, uh, they are not allowed to join or become a member? That is correct. So I've also heard that um, some of the, uh, the documented judgment list for places like Federal Express, UPS, Verizon, Fresh Direct, each with many judgments, but they were all allowed to maintain 
membership in the stipulated fine program. Is that true? I would have to look at specific examples. To the best of my knowledge, that's not true. So is there, are there instances where companies who are in, in judgment, who have a judgment against them, are allowed to may, remain in the program? I think we would only allow people with judgments to remain in the program if there was some type of error or delay on our part. It's not something that we would typically grant to a company. Okay. Uh, according to DOF's parking brochure, nearly half or about 45% of all tickets that are disputed are dismissed. Do you consider this dismissal rate to be high? I consider it to be about right. I, I think it shows our commitment to fairness. We let our ALJs decide the, the cases on their merits, and we don't have a target percentage for them to adhere to. So are they, is it typically based on the merits, or is it for, more, for a, a technical reason or for some other reason that the approximately half of the tickets are dismissed? It's on the merits. Um, as I mentioned during my testimony, there are a variety of potential defenses that someone may offer in contesting a parking ticket, and if the ALJ agrees that any of those are present, um, then they are bound to dismiss the ticket. Do you get a breakdown in terms of the reasons why they, they're dismissed? I, I don't have that here. We, we do have, um, we do keep track of reason codes, so we could provide the council with that information um, given some time. So in your opinion, what could um, the city do to uh, improve uh, this, the, uh, the dismissal rate? Do you, you mean reduce the dismissal rate? No, to, to more fully implement it or to make sure the tickets are being written correctly. Right. So certainly we find that tickets are more are less likely to be dismissed when they are issued by handheld devices um, rather than being handwritten by um, ticket agents. So I, within the police department, it's our understanding that the traffic enforcement agents use the devices, but that the police officers um, handwrite the tickets. And we think in other agencies, um, particularly the sanitation department, the um, most of the tickets are handwritten. So increasing the use of the devices would be one way to do it. I also mentioned during my testimony that we are um, looking at writing legislation regarding a recent court case that made a, a fine distinction between um, two different play types. Um, one is um, apportioned, which are for trucks that um, are used in, say, multiple states. And the other one is International um, Registration Plan, IRP, um, which pertains to trucks that would also be used in other countries. Um, so um, having legislation that would not force um, our agents to make such fine distinctions, especially for trucks that are registered outside of New York State in states that do not make that um, distinction in their play types um, would be helpful. Um, Joshua, do you have something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, Mr. Chairman, that um, one of the ways we're uh, working with Department of Finance to uh, improve the, um, the rates at which uh, the, the uh, violations can be upheld is by rewriting the, the rules around double parking, the, um, the existing double parking rules actually provide some latitude to um, double park more latitude than, than maybe is uh, appropriate given all the changes that we've seen in, in the last several years of the population increasing more e-commerce, more deliveries. Um, so we've made, uh, we've proposed some, some very significant changes to the double parking rule uh, moving away from this um, concept of expeditiously delivering, which is a little 
uh, vague, which is not helpful when you're trying to make a, a violation stick, to uh, actively engaged, actually making the delivery at that moment. Um, there's a 30 minute time limit in the existing, we're moving to a 20 minute time limit. Um, we're expanding the zone of Midtown in which double parking is completely forbidden. Um, we are tightening up uh, the, the definitions of how far you can be from a, a legal parking space. And we're also adding um, a provision that you cannot block the only lane of travel in, in any direction. So I think Council Member Constantinides brought that up before, and rightfully so. That's a, a, a serious issue. So those are some of the parameters we're trying to tighten around double parking, and that's a very large portion of the commercial-related violations. And so that, that should help uh, with the rate of um, dismissals as well. Has any thought been given to loading or unloading the zones because um, even in neighborhoods today, we see such a large increase in terms of the number of packages that are being delivered. Every afternoon when I go home now, you know, there's very little in the mailbox, but there's certainly a large number of packages, and that's not going to go away. And I think that um, part of uh, the thinking needs to include ways that we can provide some of these companies with uh, a way to be able to deliver the packages without uh, facing the fines. Uh, council member, it's a really good point. Um, we agree very strongly. Um, we just, uh, DOT, uh, as part of our safety projects, we actively um, look at all of the parking regulations along any corridor, say we're doing a, a bus lane or a pedestrian safety project. We, we also survey the parking, look for opportunities to create dedicated space for loading. Um, so that's a proactive approach we do. We, we um, are very happy to hear from communities or council members where, they, where uh, there's perceived to be a, a concern about loading. We just did some work on Austin Street and Forest Hills, working with um, the council member, the community board there, the business owners. We created a lot of dedicated loading space, time of day, um, that actually coincides with when the deliveries were, were most frequently occurring and then leaving uh, paid passenger parking for customers in the afternoon when fewer deliveries were occurring. So um, that was a street where it's one, I don't know how familiar everyone is with Austin Street, it's one lane in each direction. So if someone is double parked, you gotta cross the double yellow to get around them, it's not a safe situation. So getting space for those deliveries was very important there for safety reasons. Um, so that's been working well. We, we look forward to doing more projects of that nature, but mm. you're right, same thing is actually more delivery space. I was gonna say the same thing is actually true in Jackson Heights, my district, where you have uh, you know two-way roads and uh, very little opportunity. Although we have Park Smart for deliveries, um, it still has not really changed the behavior for those deliveries as much as we'd like to see. But I'm also interested in residential areas, uh, particularly where we do have bike lanes and you see double parking in bike lanes in the residential areas as well, because FedEx or UPS, whoever it may be, is making deliveries to apartment buildings. Right, yeah, I think it makes sense. It's sort of a new territory that we need to get into for sure, because uh, as, you, as you mentioned, there are just more and more deliveries taking place in, in residential areas, so we look forward to the, continuing the dialogue with you. Okay. The Office of Parking Summons Advocate has been uh, open only since December of 2018, and the council has very limited um, information about the function and performance of the office. How does the Parking Summons Advocate connect with the people who may need this assistance, and is it only at the uh, finance business centers and via the, uh, the website? So right now, he is at the uh, business centers. That is the easiest place to reach him. Um, the, what he does, uh, the parking summons advocate right now, as, as Jeff, the deputy commissioner, here outlined in his testimony, he helps individuals with their specific appeals. Because as we can all attest, it's a complicated process for some folks. So what his real value add and his, what he's trying to do is really help people navigate that process so that they can appeal their ticket in a way. Ms. Feinberg, does, it, yes. does, does he help before they have to take a plea? 
Um, he can do that, but I think oftentimes when they reach out to him, it's when they get that first verdict back that they want to appeal, and that's where he's really helpful. And um, uh, council member, I, I would also note that in some instances, he's reached out to the Department of Transportation when um, customers have pointed out um, confusing or misleading signs. So his role goes beyond just helping with the um, particular hearings. And how, how much um, publicity have you done in terms of outreach to let people know that this position exists and that that person's there for help? I think we uh, started the soft launch last fall and uh, we're being more aggressive with that communication now. I just also wanted to note that he has handled uh, 381 cases and 561 inquiries, and the cases completed have resulted in the dismissal of 321 tickets with a value of $33,736. Okay, and, what, and I, I would add to that that we are looking to include information about the office in our parking ticket hearings. We, we haven't done that yet, but um, now that the office is up and running, we are looking to do that in the near future. Okay, and well, how much, how much staff does he have? I believe right now he has a staff of four people. Uh, does the Office of Parking Summons Advocate have any data on the number of people? Uh, you just gave that, I'm sorry. Um, has the Office of Public Summons Advocate already identified any systemic issues and made recommendations about how to resolve them? Not at this time, I believe he's working on a, an initial report. Uh, DOF uh, provides notice by mail of accumulating late fees. Does DOF make any other effort to collect pre-judgment parking ticket debt? So uh, one of the things that we've recently implemented was this past fall in October, we started sending emails to people who had paid for parking tickets on our website and whose um, total balance is approaching $350. So we're letting them know that they're getting close to the threshold for booting, and we're um, recommending to them that they um, address that um, before the, their car is in that situation. So do the booting and towing fees um, collected upon the vehicle redemption uh, fully cover the expenses for booting and or towing? The booting and towing fees are generally statutory. They're set by law. So the sheriff's fees are set by the CPLR. So whether they make the, the, the cost or not, that's what the law says we can charge. And then the tow rates are comparable to DCA tow rates. But my question is more about whether or not the fees that you're bringing in pay for, them, pay for the work that you're doing, Sheriff. We, we've never done an analysis of how much the revenue that we're bringing in towards the amount of resources that we put towards it because it's a court enforcement process. Okay. Uh, does DOF make any other effort to collect post-judgment parking ticket debt? For example, does it seek advancement, attachment of non-vehicle assets of defaulting parties or use the collection agencies it contracts with to collect ECB debt to collect parking ticket debt? So, yes. Um, DOF does use collection agencies for both ECB judgment debt and for parking summons debt. And our collections division will go after um, higher dollar um, debt, parking summons debt, for vehicles that have not um, been booted or towed. Uh, and we'll look for other assets, um, chiefly bank accounts, um, where it can make seizures. <clears throat> uh, what is the amount of outstanding park parking violations debt uh, on the books, and has that number been growing? Uh, I'll have to get back to you with that figure. It, it has been fairly steady. Um, we report it every year in the, in the city's budget. Uh, I, I think it's a little over um, I don't know, two to three hundred million dollars. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here and then uh, let my co-chairs um, ask questions as well. So, Council Member Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. 
as I said at the beginning, like we feel that enforcement has to continue in our city. We want for our city to be safe for, you know, and pedestrians and cyclists. But we also have seen how when it comes to seeing the numbers of vehicles being towed in the city of New York, we also have heard a lot of concern from people in the, in the underserved community about our double standard, about how there's location where there's like a no parking area. And there's supposed to be consequences, like those people should get a ticket. But we have seen many vehicles being towing in area that they are supposed to be to get a fine instead of vehicle to be towing. What is a policy that New York City traffic follow in order to tow a vehicle? So uh, I think first we want to be clear that there's two types of um, vehicle seizures that are done. So the Department of, Sher of the Finance and the Sheriff's Office, we are booting vehicles only if they have more than $350 in judgment debt. We have um, license plate reader technology that drives around all city streets. We complete a run of, of all city streets about once every two weeks, I believe. Um, and we are um, solely and only looking at the amount of parking ticket debt owed on those vehicles. In addition to us, the New York Police Department does traffic towing whenever it sees a safety or other hazard. So for example, if a car is parked next to a fire hydrant, we will not necessarily boot that vehicle unless it has $350 or more of um, parking ticket debt. The police department, however, may choose because they see a hazard of towing that vehicle even if, if it has no debt whatsoever. So I'm struggling to answer your question because I think some of the instances that you may be citing, council member, may be from the NYPD's towing program and some may be with ours and we're happy if you have examples, issues to look into them with you. I just believe that we live in like in a bubble, we live like in the movies. We know the real end of the movies but we can tell a different end. Like, come on, let's be honest. Because when we go to sleep, here we are by ourselves. The city rely. Here we are negotiating $82 billion for, 20, for the next fiscal year. And we know that that's not the case. We know that there's many hardworking people that the vehicle being towing today because we need to raise our revenue. A revenue that we need to count with in order to balance the budget. Like, I don't want to be in your shoes. And I don't say you as an individual, but the men and women that work in traffic. As a parent, and I can give you a sample, Twin Park Montessori School. 93rd and Riverside Drive. And you know, we don't have to write it down. We know that that's the case. No parking. There's someone from traffic just waiting there for the parents to go there, park the car and tow in the vehicle. Like we live in a small community. We, everyone know the story. We know that the productivity is still is part of the job that the men and women, they have to do. We mandated to do. It's not because of safety. It's because there's a number that we have to accomplish. And again, what I say is that I inform whoever breaks the law, they should pay the consequences. Whoever park a vehicle in a non-parking, it is not a matter of safety. If it's no matter of the person, the driver owed 350 or whatever amount of dollars that we already put in the system, they should get a ticket and pay, pay the fine. But every day, especially in underserved community, there, we have double standard. 
There's people from traffic, towing vehicle to individual that they don't owe $1. And that's because we, the city, give the mandate to raise their revenue. So I just hope, again, that we are able to be real to us all. I had a bill that will like the, not on the parking issue, but I have a bill that will allow a driver to park the vehicle after sanitation, clean the streets. And I mean, with some people who were representing that work, you know they told me? If we pass the bill, the city will reduce to get $38 million. So for us, especially that we balancing this budget with the responsibility that we have, and we can't take every single dollar to open, you know, the library and everything, we need that money. But we need to address enforcement. Is someone of the more than $350, and whatever is the amount that we have decided after that amount that bill goes to be towing, great, that's the law. But if anyone do the investigation, Anyone from the TV, from the newspaper, if anyone go out and, and see what's going on, there's thousands and thousands of hardworking people that the vehicle been towing because we, the city, are giving the order to traffic, go out and remove those vehicles. So you don't know about that practice. No, <laughs> excuse me. That sounds like you're referring to the uh, the NYPD, and we are not involved in that practice. I, I think it may be a little bit easier to understand that the seizure of property can occur under two different sets of principles in the law. What you're describing is a police authority to govern people for public safety purposes. No, sorry, let me, let me, nah, let me give you what it is. First of all, I know I'm not making I, the case of men and women that they are working to keep us safe. And I'm talking about the traffic division of the NYPD, who we send every day to collect revenue because we need that money. There's places where car owners park the vehicle in the non-parking, nothing related to safety. I, yes, I, and I, I, can, I can give you the sample. I, I 93rd, I, 93rd and Riverside, Riverside Drive, Twin Park Montessori School. There's a no parking there. I, I understand. Every day, there's people from traffic going around, being ready to remove the vehicle or someone who is dropping the child in school because we need to raise our revenue. I, I understand. We agree in principle. We're not agreeing on nomenclature. What, what I was saying is the principle behind seizing a vehicle by NYPD traffic towing a vehicle, that's an authority of the state a police authority of the state to govern safety in a location. That's an authority the council has, that's the authority that the state legislative body has that enables a police authority or a state authority to take someone's property. The principles behind the program in the Department of Finance is a court enforcement principle that the individuals in the process have been adjudicated and the sheriff has been given a court order to seize their property. That's how the Department of Finance's program works. It's a court enforcement program. It's not the same type of program that's used by DOT. A corner, an area, say no parking, the driver should get a ticket, traffic come and tow the vehicle. Isn't that a practice that happened in New York City? I, I think you should address this to the police department. It's, it's really not our area. Okay, I hope that in the collaboration that you established with the NYPD, then that we also are able to address that situation. We can because certainly raise this with them. They're, they're not able to be here today, but we can certainly raise your concerns with them. But they're not here today. No, they had another hearing. Okay. The Liberty Company argued that whether or not the program exists, <laughs> There are, too, there are far too few places for them to park illegally. And you heard something in that direction that the Chair of Finance also addressed. Does the DOT agree with that argument? And if so, 
what effort are DOT, are DOT working right now to, to ensure that deliveries can be made safely and efficiently in our city? Council member, it's a, it, it is a real challenge, I think, for some of these companies to find space to, to make the deliveries. Um, I don't, you know, certainly each circumstance is unique, but there's, that's definitely a real challenge out there. Um, so some of the things that we're doing at DOT, um, each street improvement project, safety project that we do, we, we do an analysis of the parking regulations and look for places where we can add dedicated delivery space um, and, and allow those uh, delivery vehicles to get in legally, safely, uh, to make the deliveries without needing to double park. Um, so that's one way we get some reach across the, um, the entire city. Um, we also um, adjusted uh, <coughs> our parking rates and commercial uh, parking rates as well um, to encourage more turnover, um, get people to get in and get out faster, um, and that's been successful. We are also um, in, in the um, growth stages of a what we call our off-hour delivery program, so we have about 500 different locations, primarily in Manhattan, that have agreed to receive their deliveries overnights and outside of the normal um, congested periods of the day. Um, and the mayor recently announced we're expanding that to 1,500 locations. So um, that's a program that can alleviate a lot of the challenges that businesses face in receiving their deliveries and the uncertainty of how long it might take for a delivery to arrive because of the traffic congestion. Um, and, and some of the cost of uh, receiving deliveries that's associated with congestion. So we have participants like um, Just Salad, Anheuser-Busch, um, Chipotle, Dunkin' Donuts, Pret, <clears throat> Rite Aid, Whole Foods are participating in that program and we're, and we're expanding it to get those deliveries at times of day that just make more sense, quite frankly, because do you wanna be competing with people who are going to school, going to work, um, while you make a delivery, or would you rather do it when it's quieter, less congested at night? That's, that's the logic, and um, it's working. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much to both of the chairs and to the panel. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to, I just have two brief questions, because I know uh, we have uh, colleagues from different committees that, that have questions. But if you can answer just briefly, but in detail, what efforts, if any, has Department of Finance taken to combat the public perception that public that parking violation hearings, whether online, by email, or apps, are skewed in favor of the city? And alongside with that, uh, if in particular, that adjudications division you mentioned that is separate uh, from the legal affairs division, which handles. Uh, enforcement matters. Can you go into more detail uh, how you, that division is taking place, and how do you how do you handle the perception that Councilmember Marcel earlier in the hearing, or oh, his opening statement, was mentioning that you're battling right now. You have a perception problem that is since it's all housed within the division of finance, that uh, that it seems fair unfair. Yes, so I think we're, we're doing a, a number of things in this area. Um, one is just we're trying to make it more broadly known that the dismissal rate on people who do choose to have hearings is 45%. I know when I go to a public presentation and I ask people, what do you think it is? Is it between 0 to 10, 10 to 20? Um, most people are raising their hands when, when it's lower. So. One is just trying to, to change the perception. Um, similarly, we are trying to, um, through our mobile app, we are trying to make it easier for people to have hearings so uh, more people can take advantage of the process. A and in particular, what we think the, the mobile app allows people to do is in the heat of the moment, they go to the car, they see that orange envelope, they're really ticked, and they can take the picture right then with their phone. There's the sign or there, you know, here's the 15 feet from the hut, whatever it is. Take the picture in the moment, upload it in the moment, 
and have the hearing registered right then and there. So we think by making it easy. I'm sorry, when you mean that it's registered right there, what does that mean? Because I've never been through that process, so <laughs> help me out. So it, it, the old process would be, well, someone would have to wait until they get home and they right. go on their, their laptop or they have to write it out okay, and I mail it in. Now it is literally before they get back in their car, they can, with their phone, take a picture of the offending sign, distance, wh whatever it is they're disputing, um, and they can request the hearing and upload the picture before they put the keys in the admission to drive away. Okay. So, so we think that's a very valuable tool to avail more of the public to a process that has a 45% dismissal rate. With regard to um, the first part of your question, so the, um, our Office of Legal Affairs reports up to our general counsel and, and deputy commissioner for legal affairs. So that's the office that's involved in, for example, we're making the legal referral to the sheriff's office each week of all the vehicles that are eligible for booting. That office is separate and distinct from the adjudications division. There is, the legal affairs office does not oversee the adjudications division which is where the um, administrative law judges are making decisions. I'm wondering if there's a better way uh, for your PR that would change your branding uh, to take place. I, I don't know, through public television, uh, more you know, social media uh, presence. I don't know if you spend some funding uh, to let the word go out because 43, was it 43, 45%? 45%, 45%, and that's a pretty good shot, you know. Yes, so we're looking to leverage more news about the establishment of the Parking Summons Advocate Office, and we will certainly include that statistic, um, and we will share that with the council. Um, we want people to know that they have help. Um, so for those people, who don't win, sometimes it's not a matter of right or wrong, it's what they present to the judge. Do they present the key evidence, or do they go in trying to show, well, I'm a, a good person? And so um, giving them those tips, letting them know um, that they can go for an appeal and what that process is, and it's not that hard, those are all things that the summons advocate is looking to publicize. We're looking to publicize that office through mailing, through social media, and we'll certainly look to um, further publicize the, the dismissal rate and um, to get input from the council on how to best do that. Okay, great. I, I just had a question, something you mentioned that I didn't know. Is, you say it's illegal to double park in Manhattan? So in, um, there's a defined z part of Midtown um, that where it's illegal to double park currently, and we're expanding the boundaries of that under our rule changes. And that's because? Because of, it's mainly a congestion um, ba rule to, to you know, reduce the likelihood of congestion. So you know what my next question is? What about the R borrows? Don't we go through the same thing? So, Absolutely, and, and you know, council member, it's a very good point, and that's why one Thank of the you. new, the other new provisions in our um, rule is actually that on a, a a street that only has one lane of traffic or one lane of traffic in each direction, you will no longer be allowed to double park on on that lane if it's the only lane to travel. So, like Austin Street, what we talked about before, or I, give me a two-lane street in your district, won't be eligible for double parking anymore. It is today, but it won't be under the new rule. And when is that going to affect? So, so if, if you're trying to, you know, make a delivery on a, on a one lane street and you would have double parked, you won't be allowed to do that From anymore. From this day forward? Well, for, you know, when the new rule takes effect sometime this summer. We're, we're having summer. the hearing okay. on the rules um, later this week. Um, so probably take effect in the But it's still, the standard's still different because you're only talking about one lane. In Manhattan, is a whole... This is a restricted it's, zone. This yeah. is, is a zone, and right. there's compatible district, I will argue, 
in other boroughs. So yeah. it's just I just put it out there in consideration. Yeah. I'm also I'm, in the no, it's a, transportation it's a committee, and, we, and this comes up a lot. Yeah. So uh, I, you know, that's we we should continue talking about it because maybe there's you. a way to incorporate that in a future uh, version of this. I appreciate that. And just one last thing, I want to give a shout out uh, to the sheriff's department. You guys always do five star work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me say we've been joined by Councilmember Menchaca and Adams, and now we have questions from Councilmember Joe Nye. Thank you, Chairs. Um, in a perfect world, we'd have sidewalk space for mothers with strollers, enough space for pedestrians, uh, parking that's adequate for all whether it be passenger or commercial trucks, a bike lane, a bus lane, and enough travel lanes uh, to accommodate the needs of New Yorkers as well as handicapped parking and accessibility. We don't live in that world. New York City wasn't built that way. My concern is to go back to the question that was asked about when vehicles are towed. What is the cost or booted for a vehicle after they've reached the $350 threshold, car gets booted. If it's not paid within 24 hours, they are then towed. What is that total dollar amount that is imposed now on that driver or that vehicle? Hello, first off, my name is Joe Facito. I'm the sheriff. Uh, to answer that question, first, when we seize the vehicle, uh, the, the owner has 48 hours to redeem the vehicle. After that point in time, <clears throat> the cost that gets added on to the motorist is about $80 in fees. They're called sheriff or marshal fees. They're set by statute. The CPLR dictates what those fees are. And then 5% of the judgment amount. So the amount will vary depending on the principal judgment that originated the seizure. And then there's the towing costs, which can vary, which de usually depends on the rate with DCA. They, they go up and down. We do try to keep it in a limited format. You know, we try to limit the amount of tow costs, but sometimes if a vehicle is a large size vehicle, like a bus, that would cost more to tow than, let's say, an automobile. All right, let's use a regular passenger vehicle, two door, four tires. Um, $350, they don't, within the first 48 hours, what is that total penalty, including average tow? I, eyeballing it, it would, it would probably come out to around 600, slightly over $600. So $350 fine now has a $600 penalty, tow fee, uh, boot fee on Cor top. Correct. And twice that of the, almost twice that of the original tickets. And, and it was actually designed that way. It yeah. was baked into the legislature in, in regards to judgment enforcement. Remember, early on I said that we use a judgment enforcement process. Mm -hmm. So the Parking Violations Bureau has no right to tow a vehicle. The ability to seize a car lies with the sheriff or marshal. So when the sheriff or marshal is enforcing a process, the law says that when you have a judgment against, debt against you, you have an obligation to pay it. So you have an obligation to pay a judgment when it's against you. If somebody sues you in court or if parking violation sues you in a tribunal, you have an obligation to pay it. And if you don't pay it, the law doesn't want vigilantism. They don't want people taking the law into their own hands. So even though this was a private, even though the city's involved, when there's litigation, it's considered private litigation between the parties. And then the state legislature says, if law enforcement has to get involved in that dispute, then that cost has to be borne by the party who didn't comply in the first place. So yes, there is a, 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 a increase in the cost if the sheriff or marshal gets involved, but it's designed that way by the statute. Marshal, thank you for sure. the limited time. I just yeah. want to get to the point. My point being is that I'm certain there's a reason why those tickets aren't being paid, and it's most probably the most common explanation is affordability. I just don't have it, let alone now the double punishment of $600 in towing fees and penalties on top is an unfair burden. There's another way to do this, and that could be when they go in for renewing of their licenses, that you don't renew their licenses until all tickets are paid. When they do their annual 
vehicle inspections, when they do their registrations, we can find other ways. Let's not, the idea is not to hurt New Yorkers, make sure they pay for the fines that they're supposed to be paying or at least be held accountable. But last I reviewed this, there's a, there's a real sense of success in owning a car. And I feel, as many car owners do, that they're viewed as another means to raise revenue, whether it be through fines or parking fees or tickets or registration fees or plate fees, is just another way to squeeze another dime out of the pocketbooks of everyday New Yorkers. Can you tell me about the DOT policy on commercial deliveries? Are they allowed trucks to park in parking lanes to make deliveries? Uh, trucks are, are allowed to park in parking lanes to make deliveries, yes. At any given location, at any given time? Oh, there, you know, the, the regulations vary block to block, so you've got to refer to the regulations in effect on that block, but as a general matter, they don't have to double park or be in a loading dock, they, they may use the curb lane, the parking lane. So There's no restriction on them using a regular parking lane anywhere in the city of New York to make a delivery? There are restrictions, but they're case by case, you know, it depends on, on the regulation on that Can you block. tell me that some of those restrictions, what they could be? No standing, uh, you know. Um, no, well, there's regular zone. passenger vehicle parking options. So a uh, passenger vehicle can park in designated areas. Are there any restrictions on commercial trucks so from parking in the same spots as a regular passenger vehicle? For parking, yes. So you, I, I'm sorry, I thought you were asking about making a delivery specifically. Parking or making a delivery, okay. use of. So there are more restrictions upon where they can park um, and fewer restrictions on where they can make a, a delivery. It's different, you can't park a commercial vehicle in a residential area overnight, for example. Commercial corridors. Right, on a commercial corridor, you can make a delivery, yeah, generally. Can, you can a truck park there on a commercial corridor? It depends on what the regulation is on that corridor. What are some of the regulations that would prevent a commercial truck from parking in a passenger parking space on a commercial corridor? No standing, um, taxi stand, things like that. Restrictive uh, regulations. Those restrictions further create a, a burden on commercial vehicles for parking. And it's, it's, it's a balancing situation, right? right? You want to accommodate the, the needs of people who want to park to patronize the businesses, too. So there's, right. there are multiple needs, usually, on any given right. block. So in a perfect world, we'd have an adequate parking spaces, driving lanes, bus lanes, bike lanes, sidewalks, handicapped parking. That's a perfect world, but this is not a perfect world. The point I'm trying to make is parking and delivery of commercial vehicles is integral to this city as the MTA, whether it be bus use or train use. And the problem that we have, and you go, I go back to one of the, besides the restrictions that commercial trucks have or commercial vehicles have from parking on commercial corridors, just finding space to make a delivery. And I'm gonna use a perfect example, Vision Zero taking two lanes, road diet, make it into one lane, add a bike lane with only a select place for commercial trucks to park to make deliveries. Today, Morris Park in my district, a mile and a half stretch with more than 100 businesses, is going to have a 30-foot section for commercial trucks to park and make their deliveries impossible to meet the, the demands of those commercial corridors, impossible for those supplies and deliveries to get to those merchants. But what will, will happen is those trucks will have to double park, forcing vehicles to either come to a dead halt by creating congestion and blocking the only traffic lane, or they have to use side streets or they have to risk a head-on collision by driving 
over the markings and risk a head-on collision from oncoming traffic. A mile and a half of a commercial corridor with limited delivery spaces where there's already a high demand for parking of pedestrians and customer use for 100 businesses. What's going to happen is you're going to have traffic agents out there giving tickets to those delivery trucks quicker than they can blink their eye. I can call NYPD and talk about a drug deal on the corner, wait two hours for someone to respond, but I'll have 10 traffic agents there walking by issuing tickets in the same time frame. It's unfortunate. More needs to be done to stick up for our business owners because those delivery trucks are hard-working New Yorkers, meeting the needs and the demands of our small businesses, and they've only been squeezed as piggy banks. It's not fair and it's not just. It's set up to fail. Um, for the fleet program, what are the qualifications? Is there a number of trucks that you must have of vehicles that you could apply uh, or w when it was in operation? or anyone that owned a commercial vehicle could apply for the, for the fleet program benefit? Yes, so one or more commercial vehicles, and, and I do want to be clear because we've discussed two different programs today, so that's true for the fleet program, which you reference, where enrolled companies um, receive regular notification of their tickets and they can contest them, and the stipulated fine program, where companies big and small can enroll and they agree in advance to waive their right to contest, but they pay the average outcome roughly of what happens in the fleet program. I, I've exceeded my time uh, and I'm gracious to the chairs, but I'm gonna, ask, I'm gonna make one more statement. We Thank have you. to do a better balancing act on making sure that we don't target these deliveries or the illegal the double park cars because the punishment and then subjecting them to a $600 fee on top of it and the average ticket for a meter, for what, for a hydrant's $115. If you don't know that you received a ticket, that increases in fine. So within two tickets, you can hit the $350 mark, not even know about it because your son used your car and ripped up the ticket, be subject to $600 fine on top of it, hurts New Yorkers. We need to be more mindful that we shouldn't be using this where we're not holding a hammer in one hand and a pair of scissors in the other saying which one would you rather have because New Yorkers don't deserve it and they just can't afford it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to follow up a little bit on that, uh, isn't there an opportunity for a respondent who owes more than $350 to enter into a payment plan? Yes, there is. Can you describe it for me? We offer um, payment plans, so it, it, um, the terms vary, but if people come in and they need a payment plan, we will um, agree the terms to, with them and we will place an enforcement hold in our database so they do not face the risk of being booted. Is there a different variety of them, payment plans or a number of them, different plans that you have? So for all our, the. The plans vary in terms of, of um, length and number of payments. Um, the key thing is that interest does continue to accrue, um, so we urge people to enter into a, a, as short a plan as they can uh, for which they can afford. And, and then if a car is booted or towed, um, is there a way that they, from what I understand, they can pay 50% of the fine and then still retrieve their car? They c if they have an issue, they can come to the Department of Finance. They can speak to the parking ticket advocate, as which was described earlier. They have various payment plans. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a court process. There is a whole segment of the CPLR that, that could modify the enforcement procedure. So someone, if they're completely unhappy with the Department of Finance's approach, can go to the civil court and ask for a protective order directing how enforcement could be done. 
but I right. was but more it, 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 it typically, if somebody is having trouble through a lack of means um, for a booted vehicle, we will require that the sheriff and towing fees be paid up front, um, and we can work out an arrangement for the remainder. Okay, that's what I was trying to get at. Thank you. All right, and uh, Council Member uh, Powers. Good, thank you. Um, thanks for the testimony. I'm just gonna go, I have a couple questions and I'll try to go quick. Um, you mentioned that you're expanding the Midtown area, which I think is probably in my district. Can you give more details on what you're expanding with regarding to, uh, I think it's the illegal parking? Yeah, it's an expansion of the, um, the area in which double parking is forbidden. Um, I'll, uh, I will get you the boundaries um, after the hearing, if that's okay, I don't have it here. Sure, what are the boundaries today? Um, I don't have the exact boundaries with me today, but it's, it's the core of Midtown. Um, and is it 14th, I think it's 14th to 60th, is that right? Yeah, 14th to 60th, yeah. We're, lo we're looking it up right yeah, now. Yeah, I, I just, I'll just say, I, I'm, I have ex expressed surprise that double parking's not illegal everywhere and just in the central core of Manhattan. Uh, so is there a reason it's, for that? It's, there are cases in which it can be legal. It's not legal everywhere and only legal in, in Midtown, but it's expressly forbidden in Midtown. And then there are mitigating circumstances which can make it legal. Um, which is uh, if you're expeditiously um, making a delivery or service call, um, there's a 30 minute time limit. Um, if there's no available parking on the same block on either side, I'm telling you the current yep. guidelines now. Yep. Um, so what it's going to change to is you need to be actively engaged in a delivery pickup or service call, 20 minute time limit. Um, this, the, the available space that, that could be considered um, is only 100 feet in either direction on the same side of the street. So if there's an empty spot on the opposite side, you have to take it. You cannot double park um, under the new um, concept. And then if you're, another new element is if you're blocking the only lane of travel. So you're on a one lane street, um, like a side street, uh, or you're on a two lane, two, one lane in each direction, two way street, you wouldn't be able to double park there either for safety reasons. So those are some of the new restrictions. So, um, existing? Okay. Okay, so the existing zone is 14th Street to 60th Street, 1st Ave to 8th Ave, and the expansion is west to 12th Avenue. Just west, not north or south? Correct. Correct. Okay. So it'll um, we'll still be 14th to 60th and 1st to 12th instead of 1st to 8th. Okay. If you can get us a copy of that, I know that I think it's count, that's four council members, maybe five that have that area. It would be, I think, helpful for us to just know sure. what's being proposed. Yes. And we have a hearing on Wednesday um, for that, okay. those rules. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, we haven't talked about the booting program as much. I just wanted to get an update in terms of implementation of that. I, I, I'm going to keep going if that's okay. Uh, the I think you guys were in a pilot, or are you are you now expanded citywide or to specific areas in terms of the booting program, the self-release booting program? The the booting program is running citywide. We just did a renewal of the contract, so we have a, a citywide patrol currently for all booting that's going on in the city regarding the Department of Finance. So you have a new citywide contract for that? We, we're, in the we're in the contract process right now as we speak. Got it. It's gonna, and is for New Yorkers, does that mean it's going to stay the same, or is it different? Like, what is a reasonable expectation in terms of old change under a new, a new contract? The only reasonable expectation is we're looking to expand technology, that we're looking to have better data, more reporting. Uh, we may add other types of judgment forms into the program, but that's later down the road, and, and, and it's not really being discussed in the in initial phases. Okay, and to some people have raised concerns in other hearings about it, either in the, like even my colleague was mentioning the cost of it. Um, can you give us some input on how the contract, if you're renewing it, you're keeping the same person, the same vendor? I, I, I can't speak to the contract process while we're in the Oh, it's still going on, okay. Yeah. And um, but any, can you just share, share any feedback in terms of how it's working and, uh, so, so far, I know that you scaled it up and whether... Okay, uh, the, the fees are actually, for the booting program is actually going down. We're actually looking to reduce it. I think it's about 
10 or $15. I, I, I don't want to go into great detail because we're still in the middle of the contract process, but that was one of the things we were looking at. Commissioner GI was looking to reduce the actual cost, credit card, the additional fees on credit cards. So finance has been looking to decrease the cost associated with, with the booting program. The cost, the cost of, like, uh, beyond the 350 Correct. or whatever you have to Correct. pay for the ticket. So w when we seize it, it's the principal amount plus interest accruing at 9% a year, and then these other fees that get attached to it. Okay. I want to just ask maybe one final question here, which is, um, in my district, I have a tremendous amount of complaints in one particular area around uh, post office parking and the USPS and their seemingly willingness or ability to flaunt or, or allowance, to, I guess, uh, uh, to flaunt all city parking regulations and uh, just complaints about them in particular areas. I know I've actually seen this in other areas. What are the rules for post office parking as we're having a conversation around parking and violations? I, I can't speak to the rules. I can only speak to the seizure of property related to money judgments. If the vehicle was owned by a private postal employee, then it would be subject to seizure like any other type of person. Well, maybe, maybe DOT can answer that then. Like, what, is a, what does a post office truck have to do in terms of living under the New York City parking regulations? So, you know, we want all uh, vehicle operators to comply with, with the rules that are out there. I don't think we have different expectations for different, um, you know, owners. The, the, there's, uh, so let me, let me focus this a little bit. They are, uh, the post office's position is that they do not have to comply with New York City parking signage and regulations. Is that, does the city, the administration agree with that? So, I, I from the Department of Finance, so we, we don't agree with that. Um, what we are lacking is, through federal law, the ability to make them pay. Got it. Okay. Because they believe that since they're the federal government, they don't have to comply with the... So, right. I, have a, so I have a question on that front. Does the post office have to comply with zoning laws? We're, we're not the zoning panel. And I know you're not. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> there may, it, it's no, it just raises the question of what they have to where, live... You know. Yeah, I mean... This happens with, with state entities as well, where you know it, it's an interpretation that because they're from a higher level of government, they don't need. I, I, I understand. And and the and, but the administration believes that they should be paying the tickets and complying with the the, yes. the signage up there. We do. We agree. It's a, an issue. Got it. So I, I would at least a, a, ask and, and offer to participate in some conversation. There's other council members about this issue. I'm happy to have, invite them as well to have a conversation because they have been completely, in my district at least, completely flaunting any laws. And, you know, to be fair, like everybody else has to live by it and their decision to take up parking spots and do it seems unfair, especially when they've, they've willfully sold off parking uh, garages. But we, we I would love to have a conversation. Yeah. We, we welcome that conversation. We share your concern. Yeah, great. So Thank you for that. Glad to join you as well. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks to the chair. Councilmember Yeager followed by Councilmember Adams. And I also want to say we've been joined by Councilmember Deutsch and Councilmember Richards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just uh, to piggyback on Councilmember Power's question, you can't actually even summons the post office vehicles, can you? Because they don't have license plates. Does anybody know that? They, well, they don't it, have license plates. So, yeah. how, do you, how would you summons them? So, we we what we don't issue the summonses. Finance doesn't issue the summonses. We'll check with PD okay. how, how they do it. Never mind. I'm on the clock. We'll go quick. Um, I would like to talk to you about uh, introduction 1066 by Councilman Lanson, the uh, interests of justice dismissal, um, uh, which you opposed, and your reason for opposing it. And I don't want to characterize it, so I'll read it. Um, the dismissals would likely be subjective, right? Okay, well, that's an interest of justice dismissal. It's subjective. It's, uh, it's based on, you know, the 70-year-old walking in to the judge and saying, yeah, I got the summons, I am guilty, but I live on a fixed income. I've never gotten a summons before. Hey, can you dismiss it? And the judge says, yes. Right now, the judge can't do that. This bill would allow the judge to do that. That's an interest of justice dismissal. So isn't your objection something that you would anticipate we considered in drafting this bill? So uh, I'm not going to um, guess. Okay, what, I'll what, answer that. But yes, but, but, uh, the answer is yes. It's, 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 uh, the point is that right now judges don't have the ability 
to dismiss a summons in the interest of justice based on a good, not excuse for having parked that way, but hey, can you forgive me this one infraction if you don't mind? And the judge says yes. And you've, you've uh, um, uh, further testified that, um, that uh, you don't have, the bill doesn't give a methodology or rubric that would give guidance to the judges as to when to abate a penalty without dismissing the entire ticket. But you can write rules to that effect if you wished, right? So we think it would be, you've mentioned two things in, okay. in your, your question that, that I think are worthy of consideration. One was you made reference to income, someone on a fixed income, and you also indicated that um, someone who I think didn't get a ticket for. So we think that it's important to be explicit in the um, bill itself, and we're happy to have that Don't you trust your ALJs to make wise decisions? We trust them to make wise decisions when we give them the proper guidance for them to do so. But that's the point of the bill. The bill is, uh, the bill is to authorize judges to dismiss when they feel, it's a feeling, it's subjective, that the interests of justice uh, would be served by the dismissal of the summons. You don't really need rules. Um, just have to make sure the judges are not on the take. I assume we can take for granted that we don't think the judges are on the take. Um, and they could just dismiss it. It, it, the, the statute is being written specifically to deal with the issues that there are no rules to govern some situations. And getting rules to govern the situations of dismissal in an interest of justice, I think, uh, would sort of run counter to the whole point of the bill. So we think that objective criteria are, are better than subjective criteria. Um, we welcome working with the council on this. We, we well, find that the best legislation um, that we've done, for example, we have new payment plans on property taxes that we worked with with Chair Drum and the council it was over a year in the making, but I think both sides feel that we came up with a really good bill. Well, so let's, let's talk about working uh, with the council on it. The bill, uh, have you had any conversations with the council about this bill at all? I have not. I've okay. only recently the seen bill the bill. was introduced here in the council in this chamber on August 8th of last year. And here we are in April. And now you're telling us that you'd like to work with the council to get a better bill. And I'm suggesting maybe in the last eight months would have been a good opportunity to do so. But that's not really a question. That's just, that's just me. Um, I'm just, I'd like to talk about your pay and dispute program for a moment. Um, because you said something very interesting, and I'd just like to explore that a little bit. Um, you, you said, and I like it. You said, you know, someone gets a summons, and they can snap the picture right then and there, upload it. But then you seem to indicate that there's a particular credence given to the, based on the time of when the uh, picture is uploaded and the defense is submitted. Uh, you didn't indicate? You're just no, shaking your head. No, um, no, I think all I was saying is that um, somebody, when they first get the ticket, is probably most upset, and this program allows them to act on it. Um, it's not about that um, that should be given more credence. It's um, So it isn't. It is, it isn't given more credence based on the timing of the, dis of the defense submitted, you know, within 10 minutes of getting the summons as opposed to, an, you know, an hour or the next day or six days later. I, I don't think it's the time. I think it may help okay. to take a picture where the vehicle's actually there. So if you're saying the vehicle was far enough from the hydrant, better to have the picture where, where the, the vehicle is right there than to come back a day or two later and, and to say, oh, the vehicle was up to this tree. If a, if, a, if a summons is issued for violating the 15 foot rule on a hydrant, and let's use your example, and the respondent submits a defense saying, hey, I was only 10 feet away from the hydrant, here's a picture. Can you imagine a scenario that a judge dismisses the summons based on that defense and that defense alone? I, or let me, I, let me rephrase it or give a better, uh, um, give better clarity. Isn't the burden on the defendant to prove, to, is, isn't the summons issued prima facie evidence that the violation was committed and thus the burden is shifted upon the respondent to disprove that prima facie evidence? How would the respondent's picture disprove anything. I'm just asking you how does pay and dispute make a difference in the lives of anybody with a picture being able to be submitted? Are, are judges give, being given instructions as to how to uh, receive this information and how to give credibility to it? 
the, our judges look at many, many pictures when they make the determination, and there is a dismissal rate of 45%. Uh, I don't, our, okay. No. No, it's good, I'll take it, thank you. I just wanted to add that the, the payer dispute app is really for the individual who wants to dispute their ticket. What we're trying to do is make something easier for make it people. Easier. No, I got that's, it. I appreciate I it. I just sure I want to make sure that it's clear about what the purpose and the nature of it. I have one more question with regard to introduction 1141. In the previous administration, there had been a program at uh, 1141 is the abatement, uh, the big bill. Okay. In the previous administration, there had been a program that if someone receives a summons, the respondent can go online and say, I don't really like this summons, don't have to give a reason, hit submit. The system spits back, uh, well, this $35 sum is pay $25 and you're good to go. And are you familiar with that program? Uh, I'm aware of that. Okay. And uh, no excuse necessary, and if the respondent accepts it right then and there, can pay it, no defense needed to be submitted at all. Yes? I believe that's okay. how it worked. The 1141 um, has, now I know we don't have that program today, and there's no indication that the administration wants to do it, and it's within the discretion of the administration to do it if it chooses to, or upon the council to require it if it chooses to. Um, so right now, it's not happening because neither the administration wishes to do so, and the council has not so instructed the administration to do so. The uh, introduction 1141 has, uh, as its last sentence, um, in section one, no city agency may agree to reduce fines for parking violations in exchange for a waiver of the right to contest such violations. As I read that sentence, if this introduction was adopted, uh, the city would not be able to create such a program for the individual motorist who receives a summons. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so it's not just that the summons battles the, if if there's a problem with the fleets or not, or if there's a problem with the commercial abatement program or not, but it actually would forever, at least until it would be amended, prohibit the city from ever creating a program to help the average motorist who has a clean record and submits their summons and says, you know, I'd like to take part of this program if the city should ever wish to have such a program. I believe so. Okay, all right, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I, I appreciate uh, allowing me to go over the time. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. And as a follow-up to that also, uh, I thought that administrative law judges do have the discretion to uh, determine the outcome, uh, but just that the Department of Finance has not established that criteria by which to um, uh, uh, inform the ALJs that they can do so under certain circumstances. So administrative law judges have the authority to dismiss tickets entirely. Currently, they do not have the authority to dismiss just a penalty um, and to instate the, the rest of the ticket, which I believe is the purpose of, of the bill. Okay. Um, Council Member Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank the panel for coming in this afternoon. Thank you all for your testimony. In taking this just to a, a slightly different track, just for a second, and looking at transference uh, from the Parking uh, Violations Bureau to Oath, if the Parking Violations Bureau were transferred from the Department of Finance to Oath, how would you envision that being accomplished? Would the Department of Finance transfer all aspects of the operation, or would there be the same that the Department of Finance should retain? Would there be some that they would retain, like the collections unit? How, how does that look? So at a high level, I, I think the purpose of the bill is to transfer simply the adjudications of hearings to oath and not to, and not to transfer other functions, um, such as noticing IT um, enforcement, uh, et cetera. Uh, other than that, it's really hard for me to comment. A as indicated in the testimony, the law department is still reviewing uh, the bill. So then we really wouldn't be thinking at this point of the impact of the transfer on its operations, its business centers, or anything else at this point? Right. A as we understand the bill, it would impact the Adjudications Bureau. Okay, thank you. Councilmember um, Deutsch. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be very brief. Um, question: The sanitation summonses go to you too, as well? It, that's parking part of ticket ECB. summons. All parking ticket summonses come to us. And it, the sanitation handwritten that's ECB that goes to different. So, um, sanitation um, enforcement agents can write parking tickets, and they can they also more frequently write um, ECB environmental control board violations. So, uh -huh. so they do both. So it does and, not, and, so, okay. And, and, so. and both come to us. So the ECBs do go to the Department of Finance? Uh, upon judgment entry. So okay. they, they come to us. Okay. I have a question about that. Um, so is someone permitted to write a description of a violation prior to observing the violation? I really don't know the answer to that question. So we don't issue the violations themselves, so I would really have to defer to sanitation or buildings or the other agencies that, that issue the, the violations. So if someone writes a defense, does that go to you? Does that come to your office? No. So um, oath, the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, adjudicates the ECB violations. So if somebody gets a violation for failing to sweep the sidewalk, for example, um, sanitation typically writes that, and then the hearing is done through the, um, the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, and then if the um, respondent still is liable after the hearing and doesn't pay and the judgment is entered, then it would be referred to the Department of Finance. So if there's a, if there's a judgment entered, then it would just come to you only for payment? Correct? Yes. So nothing else. So if there's any type of appeal, nothing doesn't come to you. Right. If somebody seeks to, to reopen the judgment and to have a hearing after judgment, that application has to go to oath. It has to go to oath. Okay. Got it. Okay. No further questions. Okay. Thank you very much. We are going to end it here. I thank you for coming in and giving testimony. We'll have follow-up questions for you, obviously, and uh, we look forward to uh, communicating with you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to call up our first panel. Um, Gerald Erdas, I believe. CJS, of violations, yeah. Glenn Bolofsky, parkingticket.com. Jack Davies, transportation alternatives. Nicole Opstein, win it. And Diane uh, Drozjak. Okay, who would like to start? Oh, yep. Just you had to hit that button so that a little red light comes on. There we go. Okay. Good afternoon, Chairman Drum, Councilman Yeager, uh, Councilman Adams, thanks for coming by. And uh, first of all, I wanna compliment the council for holding these very important hearings today on a myriad of important bills to protect the safety of New Yorkers. So in regard to 1141 in particular, um, it's about safety uh, and safety always trumps everything else. I'm sure everybody would agree with that. So when vehicles are double parked, any vehicle is double parked, creates a possible safety hazard because there's a line of vision that is blurred the line of sight is blurred. 
Um, just a quick thing about that. Uh, some of the council people before spoke about a double standard. I think that was uh, uh, Chairman Rodriguez. And there is a double standard right now um, because the individual person has to fight or pay their ticket. But uh, programs designed for the largest fleets, that's what they were designed for, um, may get off scot-free or close to scot-free. So uh, there's a testimony before this committee back in May 8th of uh, 2018. It's closing in on a year, a year from now where they said they were going to increase the fines in the stipulated fine program to reduce congestion, improve safety. Uh, the documents that we've given to the committee today show that the opposite has happened. The uh, reduction of certain fines within the stipulated fine program on page number, I think it's uh, six, shows that. Um, do you have a copy of that for yes, us? Yes, yes, we do. We do. He has them all. Here's more. There's more in there. Here's more. And more. In the back, please. More of these, please. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. So page six shows that in the New York City Stipulated Fine Program, in the comparative period using the DOF's own open data portal, it's official data of the City of New York, that for a comparative three-month period of December, January, and February that ended 2019 compared to the prior three-month period, the number of tickets issued for illegal double parking, I should say alleged, illegal double parking, um, skyrocketed here. Um, they went uh, up quite a bit. You can see the bar chart right here. The next page, page seven, due to the changes in the quote unquote increase in fines in the stipulated fine program, actually incurred, included some reductions uh, in fines for bus stop tickets as opposed to increases. Uh, there, once again, the quantity of tickets has skyrocketed on page seven. Page eight shows that the number of fines for bus lane violations have uh, basically more than doubled in the same three month comparative period of time since finance increased the fines and reduced fines in the New York City commercial stipulated fine program. Um, the increase in tickets at bus stops, bus lanes, double parking are truly safety issues. Whether it be an individual who has full use of their legs or an individual who is disabled, who wants to get on a bus, um, they're blocked at the bus stops. And to get a discount for that just seems morally wrong to me. Um, it also seems morally wrong to me that if I've got to fight or pay a ticket and if every council person has to do the same, if every priest and rabbi and learned individual has to do the same, uh, those individuals who have the most resources, the largest companies, the largest fleets, could certainly do their part and do the same for their at least on a perception basis, which another councilman uh, spoke about today, should um, eliminate this double standard. Um, so safety, safety, safety comes first. There's also a legislative history. Uh, in the same chamber here, almost 11 years ago today, I was here uh, speaking about intro 637, um, which is shown in here as well. Um, there's an index. Intro 637 was put forth by the Bloomberg administration and it sought to legislate the stipulated fine program, but this council, this committee indeed, saw fit to table that measure. Notwithstanding the fact that the legislative 
elective officials had uh, decided to table the issue, finance department uh, ignored it. They could care less. So uh, according to that alone, uh, it seems to me to be ironic uh, that they've been allowed even all these years to proceed with a program that was tabled by the very committee that could have enabled it. I, I remember clearly uh, sitting here 11 years ago and um, some of the council people were very offended by the uh, finance department's program because the police department itself came out against it. At that time, Commissioner Ray Kelly called it park and slide. And we had different council people, including a former attorney general of the state of New York, Oliver Coppell, who sat here and said, we're taking the police work of writing tickets and just ripping up these tickets, um, which is, um, terrible use of police time. We need them to uh, do the right thing and, and when they write the tickets to have them either upheld or fought and if improperly ticketed, dismissed, or paid. I'm gonna have to ask you to wrap it up. Yes, sir. Um, of course, congestion happens, uh, which causes pollution and other vehicles uh, to be double parked, you know, who are caught behind double parked vehicles. Um, and there's a time and place for double parking when it's done expeditiously. And DOT is proposing some rules um, to the extent that anybody here is still from the DOT committee, we ask them to try to put some pressure on the DOT to please uh, hold off on any rule rulemaking. Because when it comes to double parking, if any one of us has to double park for four minutes, three minutes to wait for the other guy to get out of his spot as an individual, we're ticketed. There is not even a five minute grace period. And I've seen vehicles, passenger vehicles ticketed. So I think they've kind of um, uh, absolved themselves of any legitimacy when they don't give the average guy even a minute, even a New York minute <laughs> to illegally double park. So uh, again, first uh, history of the bill, uh, which was rejected by the committee back in 2008, April 30th, 2008, safety, safety, safety. And of course, the social equity issues, social economic justice issues, there is not just an implied double standard, but a de facto double standard, which is wrong. And the congestion is costing the city upwards of 10 billion a year, uh, 20 billion according to the partnership of the city of New York for the region, um, and uh, at least half of that. And then stipulated fine program members themselves recognized the issues in the stipulated fine program. They brought suit against it because it was not administered uh, fairly. And, and to their credit, brought action uh, against the city for that uh, bad behavior. So it's an abuse of discretion. I'd like to just quickly comment about some of the things, if I may. I just need to move on. Okay, yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. All right, thank you. Next, please. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon. My name is Jack Davies. I'm the Policy and Research Director at Transportation Alternatives. Uh, I want to build on something that Councilman Jonai uh, spoke on earlier, uh, and that's uh, that as we craft city policy that governs on-street parking, it's critical that we both appreciate the context the current rules were written in and be mindful of the environment we are formulating policy in as we seek to create a safe and sustainable and equitable New York City. Uh, New York today is pretty wildly different than the 1950s planners uh, who laid out the parking laws that still largely govern the city envisioned. Uh, they assumed that the principal form of future transportation would be cars for everyone, and we know that's obviously not the case today. Uh, and these antiquated policies, they're costing New Yorkers. Um, some of the proposed policies in front of the council today are important first steps in remedying these inefficiencies. Intro 1141, which would eliminate the STIP fine program, would prioritize the needs of the many over the few and guarantee that there are no exemptions when it comes to following the law. Uh, the various bills that propose to better enforce laws requiring license plate and proper registration that limit mobile home and trailer parking and report more enforcement data will help reclaim the streets as people are in public places that we deserve. Um, our policies and our actions, they need to be in service of a mission to create a New York where no one needs a car to get around quickly, even if they have one. Um, it should be safe, it should be efficient, it should be sustainable, and the proposals heard today are an important first step towards helping us get there. Uh, and that's why Transalt's proud to support them. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next, please. Great. Hello. Thank you, Chairman Drum. My name is Nicole Epstein. I'm with Gotham Government Relations, and I represent Win It. It's an app that helps individuals dispute parking tickets. So I'm going to keep it very short and sweet and simple. Um, I'm here in support of Intro 1066 and 1141. 1066, which gives the ALJs 
the um, discretion to remove a late fee penalty in the interest, interest of justice, and Councilman Yeager actually hit it perfectly. Um, you know, ALJs are judges. Judges also think about and make decisions on issues that are much more severe than a $30 late fee penalty, you know, so thought that was perfect, and we should give our ALJs the discretion. Um, again, of course, DOF adjudicating the parking tickets as well as collecting the revenue, that is an inherent conflict of interest. And unfortunately for Jane Doe's citizen, their top or, you know, um, most popular interaction with government usually is through parking tickets. So just in the interest of good government and fairness, it really makes sense to give judges, the ALJs, the discretion to remove the late fee penalties. Again, that's not if a ticket is in judgment, which is past, I think, 120 days. No, they cannot. That's different. But if someone's coming in, you know, the point of a penalty, a late fee penalty, is to coerce compliance. So if someone's coming in there, you know, pleading their case, trying to pay and do the right thing, it's a good start. So also on another note that um, Deputy Commissioner Shear pointed out was, oh, how is this going to impact revenue? Well, for example, in 1986, um, the city of New York decided to give an amnesty program to waive the late fee penalties. What happened? Tons of people came flooding in and had hearings and paid their tickets, and there was a surge of revenue. So the same logic should apply here. And one thing on the stipulated fine program. Um, what's very important to note is that there is all this discussion about expeditious um, delivery. So the point of a hearing, the one thing that's not discussed is that when you have the parking ticket hearing for those companies not enrolled in the program, what the ticket brokers do is they go in there, they have to show with delivery receipts, time stamps, whatever it is, that it was actually expeditious. Why are we under the program just assuming it, then the word has no meaning? And that's the whole point of getting rid of the stipulated fine program. Okay, thank you. Next, please. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, my name is Jerry Vadas with CJS Violation Services. I'm a broker as well, and I go down to court on a regular basis. And as uh, Alan Maisel uh, clearly stated, we were talking about fairness. And it's very troublesome. I've been doing this 25 years, and we're seeing a, a sudden change uh, through this administration. So as we're discussing the penalties, we used to always be able to um, have that um, waived, uh, and we have certain proofs and documentation, and now they're telling us take it up with the administration. So what is happening, as uh, Jeffrey Shear pointed out as well, you have all these different programs, you have these apps, but it's discretionary on the judge. So you have all these apps, so forth, and judges again will rule against you, stating that it's not done in a timely manner, or you don't have all the photos of all the streets, or you don't have conclusive evidence of the time and the date, and so forth, so on. So we ask that we have a little more transparency, and you call us, uh, the brokers and other people, to really shed a little more opening and light on the situation at hand. Um, I just wanted to make it brief and just uh, state that um, we're hoping that you guys will uh, allow the administrative law judges to go and conduct the hearing. Uh, so it is uh, a fair, impartial hearing because now, on the contrary, times have changed. Uh, you have certain brochures that were stated of the rules and regulations that, again, uh, we talk about defective tickets, not issued correctly, and even with that now they say, well, it's an out-of-state vehicle, uh, it doesn't apply to New York City. It certainly does, we have to hold everyone accountable. So it's, it's an ongoing issue of so many factors, so you'll probably see a lot of different reports here, and the numbers are not substantiating what they're uh, claiming. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and thank you to this whole panel. I appreciate you all coming in and giving some testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman Trump. Thank you all council people and their staff. Okay. So our uh, next panel will be Leo Gonzalez, United Parcel, Arthur Miller, NYTDA Ken Thorpe, uh, Zach Miller also. And Edward Fuentes or Fuentes.
All right, let's start over here. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair Drum and members of the committee. My name is Leah Gonzalez, and, and I'm a finance manager at uh, UPS, the North Atlantic District, which covers the uh, New York City. Uh, UPS is the world's largest package delivery company and leading provider of logistics services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on intro 1141 related to the stipulated fine program. UPS operates in 220 countries and territories delivering almost 5 billion packages annually. Here in New York, UPS operates out of 12 facilities and employs 5,465 New Yorkers. We're proud to be the largest single employer of Teamsters in the nation. Even beyond directly employing thousands of New Yorkers, we deliver medicine, emergency medical equipment, financial documents, retail inventory, and other goods that support small and middle market businesses. For years, UPS has distinguished itself as a leader in safety and the delivery and logistics industry. We invest millions of dollars in health and safety training every year, and UPSers have spent more than 5.8 million hours in training. This training is generating real results on the road for our drivers and those around them. UPS Circle of Honor recognizes drivers who have not had avoidable accidents for more than 25 years. To date, over 10,300 UPS drivers have earned this distinction and over 700 drivers have been accident-free for over 35 years. UPS uses technology to increase the efficiency of our package delivery as well. All packages, including critical overnight and next day air packages, are consolidated on one truck, which reduces the number of vehicles deployed on city streets. Our cutting-edge technology allows drivers to select the most efficient delivery routes, which has helped UPS reduce miles driven by 100 million company-wide. In addition, programs like UPS My Choice and Access Points have allowed UPS to reduce miles traveled by minimizing redelivery attempts when customers are not available to accept deliveries. By participating in the stipulated fine program, UPS waives its right to contest parking tickets, thereby intensifying our drivers to park legally at all times. Unfortunately, despite UPS's extensive training efforts, drivers are often unable to find legal parking due to a lack of available curbside space. Throughout the city, and particularly in Manhattan, there is an insufficient amount of dedicated loading zones. Those that do exist are often blocked by idling for hire vehicles and other vehicles, making them inaccessible to our drivers for deliveries. This severe reduction in curbside space in recent years has resulted in a 12% increase in, in tickets that uh, UPS gets, further straining UPS's New York operations and vastly increasing the cost for private unionized carriers to service New York City customers. Conversely, the USPS does not pay tickets for taxes at all, giving them the ability to park illegally without repercussions. The abolition of the stipulated fine program put us at an even steeper competitive disadvantage and stifled future innovation and job creation. UPS fully supports truly comprehensive efforts to make New York City safer and more efficient. As we have done in other cities around the U.S., we would welcome the opportunity to partner with the city and the council to evaluate ways to maximize cursive access to meet the growing demand for deliveries. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next, please. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Arthur Miller. I'm an attorney in uh, private practice. I work with the trucking industry for over 30 years. I, I appear at the traffic, uh, at the Parking Violations Bureau, the Office of Administrative uh, Trials and Hearings, or OATH, the Traffic Violations Bureau, the, the, which is a TVB, and in the criminal courts. Um, I also publish NewYorkTruckStop.com, the online community for news and views for those who operate commercial vehicles within the city. Um, I'm a longtime Queens resident, council member uh, Koslowitz District in uh, Rigo Park, and I appreciate appreciate this opportunity to speak before the joint session of the Finance, Transportation, and Government Operation Committees. Um, when one appears in a real court, the sign above the judge's head reads, In God We Trust. The motto implies the existence of a higher power, the independence of the judge, a chance for justice and mercy. At the PVB and other administrative agencies like Oath and the Traffic Violations Bureau, the sign above the judge's head is the name of the agency that hired the judge. At the Department of Finance, the administrative law judges who work for the Department of Finance are per diem attorneys serving at the pleasure of the agency, as the city's tax collector has become more concerned with increasing its metrics, in other words, its winning rate, than assuring justice and mercy. The ALJs are losing their independence. If they don't follow 
uh, official quote-unquote policies or quote-unquote guidance on how to decide cases, their services may no longer be needed. As uh, Deputy Commissioner Scheer uh, just mentioned before, I, I think in, in, in response to Councilmember uh, Yeager's question, I think uh, uh, they said that uh, with the proper guidance, the um, hearing officers uh, uh, know how to make the right decisions. So I think there you have it. It's up to you, our elected leaders, to make sure that our citizens and those who deliver the goods and services that are the lifeblood of the city are not just viewed as revenue streams, but as respondents clearly deserving of justice, mercy, due process, and equal protection under the law. That said, I wholeheartedly support uh, Councilmember La Lansman's uh, intro 1066, giving hearing examiners discretion to reduce or waive additional penalties for parking violations. Sometimes there are compelling reasons why there are late penalties, so the, 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 um, the uh, ALJs need that uh, flexibility. Um, truly independent judges should also have the discretion to uh, uh, vacate uh, judgments, uh, judgment tickets, which are over a year old. Right now, the law does not permit them to do that. If, if, if one finds out that they have a judgment and they go to a judge, the uh, uh, um, Department of Finance says, sorry, that's more than a year old. You, we, we can't even make a decision based on that. You can't even get that in front of a judge. So I think the, that, that bill, the 1066, should go even further. Um, regarding intro 168's proposed uh, a proposal to move PVB into oath, the city's tax collector should not adjudicate its own revenue stream. Uh, the problems with the adjudication of parking tickets, though, won't be changed by merely changing the sign above the judge's heads. The council should clearly consider whether building a better adjudicatory process in any such move would, and, uh, uh, would uh, be better off. And, and keep in mind, uh, please, that with more camera-issued tickets on the way, uh, like blocking the box and passing school buses and things like that. People can get their licenses suspended. So we must be very careful to ha having the needs of raising revenue uh, that balance with those who may get their license suspended. Let me just add quickly, uh, intros five and, uh, 506 and 1187 I find extremely uh, problematic and, and those need to uh, 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 be withdrawn. W with Councilman uh, um, Koskowitz, uh, my council member's uh, bill to uh, uh, prohibit uh, parking of mobile homes says, it also says to allow uh, the, the uh, towing of trailers. Uh, one of the reasons that trailers park right now is a confluence of uh, the lack of parking for, for trucks uh, federal DOT rules that mandate, uh, they have computer uh, monitored uh, hours of service. So if a driver is out of service, that, that driver has to stop. He, 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 it would be a violation to drive on. And then secondly, you've got the mayor's uh, clear curves program where they're, they're trying to steer deliveries to only certain hours. So you've got no places for a tractor trailer to park. I think the same objectives, uh, rather than towing, could be met by changing the signage and, and, uh, and, and letting uh, uh, the tractor trailers park in industrial areas rather than just making everything a violation. Um, similarly, you have uh, uh, intro uh, 180, 1187 would permit the towing for the improper registration of a vehicle. Right now they're issuing tickets, uh, for example, for a box truck that has the license plate a little too high. If that becomes a towable offense, that's a further uh, restriction on, on, on uh, the ability to make deliveries. And what, what, what the, the city, the DOT and the Department of Finance is basically doing is weaponizing the uh, vehicle and traffic law in order to raise revenue. And if every single delivery uh, taking away double parking, uh, uh, taking away uh, 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 lanes of traffic and, and things like that becomes, makes it, makes it illegal for trucks to make deliveries. That, that's going to add a chilling effect on commerce and the ability to get things done uh, in the city. And I, I'd certainly be happy to work with the council uh, on, on, on uh, improving some of these uh, uh, proposed uh, intros and uh, providing any further uh, information uh, based on the experience and the, the clients I represent, large and small. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Zach Miller and I serve as the Retro Metro Region Vice Chairman of the Trucking Association of New York. I would like to thank Chairman Rodriguez, Chairman Drum, and Chairman Cabrera, as well as the members of the committee for the opportunity to testify before you today. For over 85 years, TANI, a nonprofit group, has represented the trucking industry in New York, advocating for the industry at the local, state, and federal levels. We provide educational programs to our members which enhance their safety and maintenance efforts and offer numerous councils and committees to meet the diverse needs of our members. TANI comprises over six hundred member companies from New York, Canada, every border state, and other states across the country, and is the exclusive New York affiliate of the American Trucking Association. 
There are several bills being heard today, but I'd like to focus on intro uh, 114, 122, and 1066, which will have a significant impact on our industry. With regard to intro 1141, the stipulated fines program, uh, which has been a crucial tool for our industry to conduct business throughout New York City for the past 15 years. Given the lack of commercial parking and loading zones in different parts of the city, our members are forced to double park to offload deliveries to many businesses. In the past, this practice resulted in thousands of tickets being issued and ultimately led to a significant backlog of cases at the Parking Violations Bureau. The stipulated fine program was implemented in 2004 to address this backlog and give our members the ability to pay off a majority of these fines and continue to conduct business in the city. In Manhattan alone, there are nearly 100,000 establishments that generate over 350,000 shipments of deliveries on a daily basis. Our members rely on the stipulated fine program as part of a way they do business. I would also like to dispel the notion that the big players in this industry are the only ones who benefit from this program. Tandy has many smaller members with two or more trucks who take advantage of the stipulated fine program. With the cost of doing business rising every day, removing a critical program like stipulated fines strikes yet another economic blow at smaller businesses who are already struggling to stay afloat. While we understand that reducing traffic congestion is a priority, we need to do so in a reasonable manner that balances the interests of the city's economy. Businesses in the city rely on deliveries our members make and complete repeal of the stipulated fine program as proposed in intro 1141 will significantly impact businesses, not just in Manhattan, but across the five boroughs. We believe the right approach to the problem of congestion should instead focus on improving curbside access for deliveries through additional and enhanced loading zones, as well as increased enforcement for existing commercial parking. Tanny is glad that the council is taking steps to reform the enforcement of parking violations through intro uh, 122 and 1066. Intro 122, which would raise the threshold from $350 to $500 before a vehicle can be removed uh, to satisfy parking judgments, is something Tanny would be supportive of. If there was additional clarification on the language concerning removing a vehicle when there's a judgment of five or more parking violations. In many cases, truck owners, especially those who lease out vehicles, and in some cases, uh, maybe out of state operators, are unaware of the number of violations that may have been issued to a vehicle. Tanny would like clarifications on the types and amounts of parking violations that the bill seeks to enforce before supporting it. However, Tanny does support the bill's intention to raise this threshold to $500 because it would give our members additional time to resolve any outstanding tickets they may not be aware of. Uh, Tanny also supports intro 1066, which will empower administrative law judges to reduce or waive additional penalties in the interest of justice. Many of our members lease out their vehicles and may not be aware of the fine for several days or weeks that a notice has been violated. Uh, we look forward to continuing the work together with the City Council to address these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're a good reader. <laughs> <laughs> the world class reader. Wow. <laughs> In Hex, please. Good afternoon. Council, my name is Ken Thorpe. And, uh, you just have to hit that red light. I'm sorry. My name is Ken Thorpe, and I'm the chairperson from the New York Trucking and Delivery Association, NYTDA. And you have one package in front of you there relative to us. Um, I'm also a member of the New York City Delivery Solutions Coalition, which includes FedEx, Fresh Direct, Coca-Cola, UPS, and others. Um, and you have a separate package submitted to you there, and I've signed in twice, and if you will, um, two things. Allow me to testify on behalf of each. Also, please bear with me. I'm just getting over a bron bronchial condition. If I do what he does, did, I will die. Primarily, I'm going to discuss 1141. NYTDA was with this program at its onset, in its early days, with a few other large companies. The difference was I represented a handful at that time of small businesses. And as Martha Stark, the commissioner at that time, testified before this committee back then, um, that I was responsible for making the program successful. Why? Because I turned it from the UPS FedEx show into the small business show. I myself put 1,141 companies in small business companies, one, two, three, mom and pop shops, and medium sized companies as well, into this program. And the program was really designed more for them than UPS, FedEx, and all the big guys I'll talk about later. Why? Because these guys are busy, they're running their trucks, they don't have time to be going to court. The fact of the matter is, stipulated fines is a small business program, and it helps small businesses. And that's something that most people don't realize, because all they think about, I'm sorry guys, but they think about the giants, and they think about, they can afford it. Well, guess what? 
My guys can't. And I'll tell you something, I've put 1,141 companies into this program. I've only got about 700 something now. They didn't leave to go to the brokers. A couple do, of course. Most of them are out of business. Not just because of the cost of fines, but because it's tough to do business in New York. We get, as small businesses, we're beaten up every day. And the guy who gets a couple extra tickets that day is not bringing food home to his family. He's not paying a bill, okay? What this program did for the average small business was allow them to not pay attention to their tickets other than the fact that we, what this program does that being outside the program does not do, it trains people. The, the whole purpose behind this, which was missed even by Department of Finance about the inception of this program, when this program was conceived, there was the difference between good, not so good, and very bad type fines. In fact, they used to have them colored. Green, yellow, and red. Severity of the fine. The idea was to train drivers to park in the less severe areas and not the worst, including handicap spots and so forth. Now, testimony was given before that these handicap spots and other safety violations went up. I think Mr. Volofsky testified to that. They went up substantially in the last quarter. He's right. Wait, except for one thing. His data is distorted. All fines across the board did. There's been a surge in parking ticket issuance over the last three, four months. All tickets, all categories, not just safety violations, have gone up. So that is distorted data and it's untrue. The fact of the matter is this program was designed to emulate hearings, and it does. You're not going, by eliminating this program, you're not going to charge these people more. You're going to charge them the same. The difference is the small businesses are going to have to incur the cost, incur the cost of paying somebody else to go to court for them or take the time off to do it themselves. The truth of the matter is there's nothing wrong with this program. Everybody here, all the stakeholders here have reasonable disputes, whether it's transportation alternatives, people with disabilities. Here's the problem, and I did this on purpose, not to be a joke. I'm not a joke. This is an egg carton. It's our city. You need a piece of it, you need a piece of it, you need a piece of it. This egg carton's not getting any bigger. We keep piling and piling, piling, piling on top. When it comes to the trucking industry, we're a captive audience. We have to come into the city. How are you getting everything you have on your desk? How are all of us getting things that, that we order on Amazon? Now I have to defend the big guys. They deliver a lot of those packages too. The fact of the matter is we, consumers, businesses and government say, bring those packages to us and bring them now. But here's the problem. We've now divided this egg carton up into everything. We got pedestrian plazas, bike lanes, bus lanes. We got ride share, bike share. This, we, the pie's gotten smaller. But what do we do? We blame the truck. Why do we blame the truck? Because he's in the way. Where's he parking, folks? Why don't we start talking about that more? Where's he parking? Not how much can we find him. Double parking rules were put together for, by smart people like you. You said there's nowhere to park. Let the guy park for a half an hour to make a delivery. It's a pain in the butt. Well, now especially with everything else we've thrown into the pie. What are we going to do? Stop. Well, you were talking about the one lane. You were talking about the one lane, the two lanes before, not parking here, not parking there. Who's serving those businesses? Who's dropping the packages off into the houses? Guess what? We're still going to do it. The only difference is we're going to get fined for doing it. Why are we going to do it? Because you demand it. And I don't just mean you particularly. All of us demand it. It has to happen. The bottom line is it's not the program. It's not the manner in which a ticket is adjudicated. It's how are we going to meet the needs in this city when we keep piling it up? We're crushing it to death. Stop looking to take away choices. We need more choices, more smart ideas. Maybe instead of 3,500 traffic agents out there giving parking tickets, maybe what we do is take half of them and do a pilot program. Which one of you guys want to do that? We do a pilot program. And here's the pilot program. Let's say you take an area, a couple of blocks, the worst blocks, and put out 50% of the agents that normally would be out giving tickets, have them at every corner directing pedestrians, keeping pedestrians and cars from colliding. You know, 
How many of you have been in an intersection? Try and drive your own car. Try to get it around the corner because the pedestrian is going to stop. Well, we have to let them go. But maybe with an agent there, instead of giving out parking tickets, directing, and the guy in the middle of the street, when the truck is double parked, alternate the traffic around them. Okay, let me just work. ask you, is that the second part of your... That's the first part. Oh, well, now, generally I don't allow the same person to speak twice, but I've, if you can make it quick, I'll, 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 I'll let you go for th uh, three right. minutes. That was on behalf of NYTDA and small businesses. No, now, I know, but you're the same person. But I'll let you speak twice, but you have to keep it that within was Ken three Thorpe. minutes. I'm Kenny Thorpe, and I'll make this as quick as I can. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. The opportunity to testify on behalf of Delivery Solutions Coalition, which is comprised of the following members. FedEx Corporation, United Parcel, Liberty Coca-Cola Beverages, Verizon, Fresh Direct, Charter Communication, New York Trucking and Delivery Association. The program was created in 2004 by the New York City Department of Finance with the assistance of many members of this coalition. The original purpose of the program to expedite payment of violations to remove the burden from the city of adjudicating hundreds of thousands of individual tickets yearly. Today, the participants of this program receive over 1 million tickets annually. Since the inception of the stipulated fines program, the city has saved millions of dollars in operational costs to adjudicate these violations through the stipulated fines program. The program has been mutually beneficial to all parties involved. It saves everyone administrative costs and the time it takes to adjudicate these tickets. Participants in the program give the rights to challenge any of the violations they receive in exchange for a base ticket amount reduction for each for such certain violations. These reductions would most likely have been achieved if they had been adjudicated in court. In exchange, the city receives a payment of violation within 45 days from the time the tickets logged in the system, as opposed to waiting several months to receive payment. The city has generated more than $40 million annually from the stipulated fines program, and this year estimated collections will be in excess of $60 million due to the increases of fees and increase in the volume of tickets given by the NYPD and TEA. Delivery Solutions Coalition respectfully opposes 1141 as it calls for the elimination of the stipulated fine program which will be detrimental to all parties involved. We cannot support the demise of the stipulated fine program for the following reasons. The stipulated fine program is mischaracterized by opponents as a free giveaway, a corporate break, when in fact the city has made parking increasingly difficult for the coalition members. The city has consistently reduced commercial loading and unloading zones while increasing bike lanes, bike racks, docking stations, bus lanes, pedestrian walkways, and city-issued parking placards. There has also been a significant increase in the number of for hire vehicles on the streets, which has significantly reduced the number of legal parking spaces for truck deliveries and other service providers. While the purpose of these initiatives is, is worthwhile, they have come at cost to those of us who need to access the curb space to make deliveries necessary deliveries and provide necessary services. Given the sheer number of vehicles delivering products and services, there simply are enough legal parking spaces in New York City. Participants do not want to get violations in the course of doing business. However, the City of New York has not presented any other options for our members to legally deliver essential products and services to our customers and your constituents and yours truly. We deliver necessary goods and provide essential services to residents, business, City of New York who would not be able to operate without the services we provide. We find our companies being targeted by NYPD and TEA daily, including new congestion pilot programs that make it increasingly difficult for our workers to do their jobs in a timely and safely manner. Now this proposed law would eliminate the stipulated fine program just four months after the DOF increased fines and have cost our companies 40% more than this time than last year without providing any other relief. The elimination of this program would disproportionately impact smaller companies that are already struggling to survive in New York City. These businesses would incur additional costs to adjudicate tickets themselves or would have to hire brokers or lawyers to do so. Brokers or lawyers are the only clear winners if the stipulated fine program were to go away because they would see an immediate increase in their revenue, which is why they would consistently lobby for the demise of the stipulated fine program. The stipulated fine program is operated efficiently for the city of New York while costing them virtually nothing to collect millions of dollars in annual revenue. We respectfully ask that you reconsider the usefulness and benefits of the stipulated fine program and leave it intact by truly understanding what the program really is, what it does, and the position that the companies and the delivery people who are residents of this city, they're your constituents, the people who are behind these trucks. Help us out, too. We're, you, we're your constituents. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Thorpe. Thank you. Next, please.
Hello, my name is Edward Punch. Can you just move the mic over so we can get that clear? The founder of Inclusion Marketing Advertisement Group. I want to thank you for this opportunity. Um, make this very short. The stipulation fine program discriminates against individuals that are disabled, people that drive. I ask you to please vote for 1141. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming in. So thank you to this panel as well. We appreciate your time and uh, sharing your opinions on the proposed legislation. Thank you all. All right, and with that, this meeting is adjourned at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.